started in many ways in early conversations during Governor Murphy's transition uh, process of how you create jobs uh, in this century. And <clears throat> what's been quite clear is that the innovation economy, that startups are really what drives major um, uh, economic uh, revitalization and job creation. So what we did um, at a time where New Jersey was known as the innovation state, and going back to Bell Labs and the biotech industry, so much of that work, particularly in the life sciences, had migrated to Cambridge, to New York City, to Philadelphia and other places. So we went and we visited those places, and visited places like New Labs and City Labs and Penovation and Research Triangle, and just from that came the concept of the New Jersey Innovation Hub. The New Jersey Innovation Hub was a place where startups, academic scientists, <coughs> excuse me, um, and students could actually ply their trade to collaborate in creating an ecosystem that will create jobs. Well, one of the things that we have found that is quite clear that when companies start, they expand, they grow, they hire people, they, 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 they grow the economy within 20 miles of where they start. So this project will not only have a significant impact on New Brunswick, but on the regional economy in the state. We started with creating, and quite honestly, the New Jersey Innovation Hub, which was going to be a place for startups, was going to be laboratory studios, uh, workspaces, co-working spaces, and it evolved in our discussions with Rutgers, is that bringing the academic scientists, the public scientists, and the private sector scientists, the startup, the student, into one environment really could bear extraordinary fruit. So what we did is have created a project, which is before you today, that has three significant components to it. Uh, it has the, new, the Rutgers Translational Research Facility, where we're creating workspaces for 80 new principal investigators. These principal investigators are working at major universities around the world and throughout the country that Rutgers is in the process of recruiting. They come with NIH, FDA, foundation grants. We're also creating a new place, a first-time place, to actually bring the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School to downtown New Brunswick, a state-of-the-art facility that are going to give first and second year medical students the opportunity to, be, to actually spend time in the hospital just down the street. As medical education has evolved, so much more of simulation and patient exposure has been important. So the building that was built in the 1960s as the original Rutgers Medical School that then became the University of Medicine and Dentistry um, will be repurposed in Piscataway and will bring all of those students, professors, and researchers to downtown. And the third component of it actually is the New Jersey Innovation Technology Hub, which will be a place for startups, uh, uh, for, for small pharma, um, to collaborate with academic scientists. We think it's an extraordinary opportunity. I think it's an opportunity for the city to actually become the epicenter in New Jersey. It represents the largest investment in life science and medical education in New Jersey history. And we're just really glad to be before you and to get this thing started and to be in the ground by the end of the year. Thank you, Chris. If there's no questions for Mr. Palladino, I will move on. Call Mr. Chris Roach for testimony. Sure, it's Christian Roach, R O C H E. Mr. Roach, you swear on front I do. Mr. Roach, you are a licensed professional engineer of the state of New Jersey, is that correct? That is. And in that capacity, you are familiar with the civil engineering uh, plans and components of the project that's before the board this evening? I am. If you could please give the board the benefit of your professional qualifications and experience. Sure. I have bachelor's degrees in civil engineering and business from Lehigh University, as well as a master's degree in civil engineering from North Carolina State. Mr. Kelso mentioned I'm professionally licensed in the state of New Jersey. My license is in good standing. I've been practicing land development engineering now for approximately 16 years. I've been qualified as an expert in front of numerous boards in the state of New Jersey previously. I think I've probably been in front of this board 20 times in the last decade, but not since the pandemic. So if you don't recognize me, it's just additional gray hair I've got. <laughs> uh, I would offer Mr. Roach for, as a qualified professional to give testimony. Uh, just uh, if you could, uh, Mr. Roach, I'm going to just indicate to you to please just give an overview of the site, and then I'm going to allow you freely to go through all the components that we typically would do to provide testimony for civil engineering. Sure. So I'll start by marking the first exhibit. This is Exhibit A1. It's dated July 6, 2022, and it's a site aerial. 
So the project site we're here to discuss this evening is approximately 3.2 acres. It's generally bound by French Street to the north, Spring Street to the east, Patterson Street to the south, and Kirkpatrick Street to the west. We're primarily this evening going to focus on the northwestern portion of the site, which is block 17.01, lot 1.03. It's approximately 1.1 acres, and it's the proposed site for the phase one building. We'll also touch upon some of the proposed site features elsewhere on site, included within Block 17.01, Lot 1.02. And as Mr. Kelso mentioned, the entirety of the site is in the current redevelopment area, and we're not seeing any variances from that redevelopment plan here this evening. So I'll move on to Exhibit A2, and I'll mark this. This is just a site plan rendering or a colored version of the site layout plan, which was submitted as part of our site plan application package. It is dated July 2022. So what the applicant is proposing to construct on property is a 12-story research and office building. It will have a total of 560,000 gross square feet of new space with a footprint of around 41,400 square feet. While the building takes up a good portion of the northwestern site area, we are proposing three main additional site features to accompany the phase one development. We are proposing a private access drive to the south of the development. This access drive will be 20 feet wide and will be one way from Spring Street to Kirkpatrick Street. To clarify, we're calling it a private access drive. However, this will be open to the public. It's just from an ownership structure. It will be maintained by the applicant and the owner. However, we anticipate that the public can use this specifically for drop-off type operations, Ubers. We anticipate that type of usage. This drive will also serve as an emergency access drive for not only phase one, but also additional future phases of the development. We're proposing a new streetscape along French Street, Kirkpatrick Street, and also along that access drive. Specifically, we're proposing 14 new street trees, along with new PSE&G standard LED light fixtures. These light fixtures have been designed to meet all of the required city lighting levels. And then lastly, we are proposing a plaza to the east of the Phase 1 building. There was a question from the planner and the engineer um, discussing what would happen in the interim scenario of the Phase 1 building were to move ahead and some of the other phases not move ahead until a distant future. So to answer that question twofold, n number one is that we are committed with the Phase 1 development. It's fully funded to construct a large plaza area to the east of the Phase 1 building. Our plans currently had shown just a 10-foot paver strip as a placeholder. We commit talking to the applicant that this plaza area will be much larger. It will be approximately 70 to 75 feet off of the Phase 1 building. And it's really meant to provide a dynamic place where pedestrians can access the site from the train station, hang out. There will be a host of other amenities within this plaza as it's constructed with Phase 1. From an overall site parking perspective, the redevelopment plan requires a total of 336 parking stalls. This is based on a redevelopment plan requirement of 0 0.6 parking stalls per 1,000 square feet. Doing the math on the 560,000 total square feet is how we got the 336 required parking stalls. Those parking stalls are proposed to be provided within a wellness parking garage, and that will include not only the standard parking stalls, it'll include the ADA parking stalls as well as the electric vehicle charging. Trash and loading operations for the proposed Phase 1 building will be handled in the southwest corner. We have a loading dock that is internal to the building. It has the ability to accommodate WD-40 sized trucks, which I like to refer to as medium sized tractor trailers. It's not the large WD-67 you see on the highway. This is tractor trailers with the 33 foot trailers. That area has been designed so that those vehicles can safely pull up Kirkpatrick Street and back into the loading area. Also within that terminal loading area is where we'll handle all our trash and recycling operations. Bike parking, there's also a requirement within the redevelopment plan to provide 0 0.1 bike stalls per thousand square feet. Doing the math on that, we have that 56 bike parking stalls, which will be providing internal for the building, as well as having some external bike racks within the proposed plaza area. Moving on to the more fun stuff, utilities and stormwater management from the utility <laughs> perspective. We've actually done quite a bit of legwork with the city and the county um, in order to develop proposed utility routing to provide water and sewer service to the site off of French Street. I say we've done quite a bit of work for two reasons. One, a timing constraint. If you've been on site, you realize that the county is doing improvements at the 
Front Street and Easton Avenue intersection. It's our desire to get all of our necessary utility connections out of Front Street before they pave that area. No one likes paving something and then seeing a trench in it two weeks later if we don't get the utilities in. I'll also note that the second part of the utilities is they've been designed to handle all of the anticipated future phases. So we've upsized our lines, not just handle for those phase one building, but we'll also handle for the future development. Stormwater management, we are complying with the state and city stormwater management regulations. Uh, specifically, we have a stormwater conveyance system, which will convey flow to the east, connected to the existing Spring Street system. We're basing our assumption under the previous developed conditions on site when the Ferron Mall property developed this was entirely impervious. And as a result of that, our new development will be reducing impervious coverage and reducing flows. Uh, there's state standards that typically allow for a five-year look back. I have had some conversations with Mr. Burke on this. He would like me to seek some clarification from the state to just confirm that. Um, so what I've done with the revised plans is, one, I will confirm that for the state. If for some reason that didn't work out and we had the five underground detention, the plans that were submitted as part of the site plan application show why that underground detention should go. So if the state doesn't agree with our interpretation, we'll install an underground detention system on site that's already been designed and reviewed as part of the site plan application process. So there are a few items I just wanted to touch on to try and address some of the comments we got from the planner and engineer. In general, we have no objection to complying with these review letter comments. There was a question about environmental conditions on the site. I'll start by stating that there is no contamination sources on the site. There are two off-site sources which contribute to groundwater flows on the site. One is a former heating oil tank from the county adjacent to Patterson Street, and then there's a dry cleaner for the west along Patterson Street. Both of those projects are under active remediation at this point. If you've been on site, the county is actually doing remediation activities and injections to clean up the air portion of the site. And then the dry cleaner is also doing the same thing. Those parties have their own LSRPs, licensed site remediation professionals, to ensure that their environmental conditions are being met. And as a second measure of insurance, the applicant also has their own environmental professional peer reviewing and making sure we're getting the end result that we want from an environmental perspective. There was also some commentary questions from some of the neighbors relative to the circulation on Spring Street. Although it's not part of our application this evening, the county, as you've seen on site, is undertaking some intersection improvements to provide improved circulation around the site. Specifically, Spring Street and Spring Street Connector will be two-way up to Church Street. The conversation mainly was focused on what will happen south of Church Street. For now, with this application, we're not proposing any changes to the one-way movement from Church Street to Pastor Street. In the future, as future phases advance, at that point in time, we think we're going to have the ability to widen Spring Street at this location, and that will allow us to provide two-way traffic while also maintaining the existing parking loader on operations in the area. So we feel that's the right time to potentially forward with those improvements. So Mr. Kelso, I think that's a high level over, but I'm sure I missed one or two. Uh, just one question with regard to the um, access road. I don't know if you you made reference to no parking on that. Road. I'm sorry, that's great. There will be no permanent parking on the access road. It will be utilized for drop off only. Uh, and uh, just for the record, with regard to the reference to the um, parking in the in the uh, wellness garage, that, that uh, um, capacity has been uh, has been provided in, in written form by the parking authority, is that correct? That is correct. We have a written letter from the parking authority showing the capacity. I know if there are questions for Chris. The board wishes to direct that. Any questions from board professionals or members? Can I ask, is, uh, since this is a multi-phase project, what do we have to look forward to in the future phases? Is it okay to ask that? You can ask that. I can't answer it, but I feel like our, uh, <laughs> my buddy Mr. Calhoun. Mr. Chairman, we're, we're uh, optimistic in working with, and we have a meeting tomorrow actually, is that the second phase, um, which is to the east of the first building, um, will be an additional office slash research facility, most likely with a major pharmaceutical company or a series of pharmaceutical companies or biotech companies or manufacturers of uh, medical devices. Uh, so that building, um, we, there's an agreement that we have um, as part of the redevelopment process 
uh, would be a minute with the parking authorities, a minimum of 300,000 square feet. But it's quite possible that building could be three or four or 500,000 square feet. Uh, we're also assessing um, opportunities for additional public spaces in addition to the um, plaza that we're building and potentially um, uh, a housing option that would include market and affordable housing. Also, the concept plan I remember seeing it had like an open space between these developments, correct? So that there'd be a kind of a, a, a pedestrian way that would be in between these, these two buildings. Yeah, that's the plaza that we're referring to, and, and we'll ask our architect, and we have some renderings that show you uh, where that would be. So. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Uh, if there are no further questions at this time, I'll call Mr. John Martin for testimony. <laughs> we only brought one pack. Please state your name, put your last name for the record. My name is John Martin, M A R T I N. Mr. Martin, you swear from Seoul, I did. Uh, Mr. Martin, you are a licensed professional architect of the state of New Jersey, is that correct? Yes, sir. And in that capacity, you're familiar with the uh, architectural design and the overall concept design of uh, the whole hub project, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, I, at this time, I would ask you to give the, the, the board the benefit of your professional qualifications and experience. Thank you. Like my predecessor, I have an architecture degree from North Carolina State University and then a graduate uh, degree in architecture from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. I am a principal and partner of Elkis Manfredi Architects in Boston, Massachusetts. And I have, we have, our firm has completed five buildings in New Brunswick, four buildings in New Brunswick. This will be the fifth. Uh, I would offer Mr. Martin as a licensed professional qualified to provide testimony in this application. Thank you. Your qualifications are accepted. Uh, if I could then, uh, uh, Mr. Martin, again, I'm going to allow you to uh, speak freely with regard to the overall design, the building design, and as Chris has indicated, the, the plaza concept um, to the extent that we have it conceptually. Thank you, Mr. Kelso. I want to start with this aerial rendering of the project. I, it's not dated. Uh, I will date it July 11th, 2022, and label it A3. This is an aerial view of the project from the north. It shows the 560,000 square foot building in the center it shows the 70-foot-wide Paseo that connects French Street back to this new service drive. And it shows a very conceptual idea of what that uh, second phase building might be at about 300,000 square feet shown here, as uh, Mr. Palladino has alluded to. That is the minimum, and it could be bigger uh, than that at the end of the day. But this particular building is, as uh, Mr. Palladino has described, uh, somewhat unique in that it does have three very vital components of that innovation ecosystem. And what makes it unique is that all three of those components are in a single building stacked one up on top of another. Often in innovation environments, you see all of these components in separate buildings. But in our particular case, we are uh, stacking them all into a single building. It's a unique opportunity, as Mr. Palladino has alluded to. It's an opportunity that came together at just the right time, and we were able to take advantage of it. Uh, I did want to point out that it has a two-story base, uh, and I'll talk about each of these components as I go up, but the base is animated uh, and made vibrant by a lot of very public-facing functions of the building. The entire ground floor, with the exception of the loading dock areas, is pretty much publicly accessible, and it is designed to activate this outdoor space, which again will come before you uh, later, uh, but that outdoor space contains kiosks and amenities, and it will be activated year-round into the evening in warm and cold weather. So. 
the idea is to make this block a destination given its proximity to the train station, given its proximity to the hospital, to the cultural district, and to the university. If we took a section, a slice through the building, and looked at it north-south, the shared social spaces that I alluded to anchor the ground floor. The floors, three floors low, one floor high, that are in red, are the translational research component from Rutgers University. I'll talk more about that in a moment. The four floors in the middle, shown here in green, are the teaching spaces for the medical education component of the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Medical School. And three floors above that are the innovation and technology hub, which Mr. Palladino has alluded to. At the top of the building is a tall, double-stacked mechanical penthouse. These labs need a lot of continuous fresh air. Uh, a lot of continuous fresh air to circulate through the building, so the mechanical penthouses at the top tend to be large. Altogether, the building is 241 feet, 6 inches from the pavement to the top of the roof. I, this drawing is, I'll date all of these, July 11th. 2022. This will be referred to as A4. just labeled A5 as a ground floor plan. The areas you see in yellow are a 10,000 square foot uh, market hall, which contains, will contain a variety of different food options, and will be anchored at the back by a 3,000 square foot sit-down restaurant that opens up onto that public paseo space. The remainder of the market hall consists of the food service opportunities and at the front a big gathering space with movable tables and chairs that can be cleared out and joined with the lobby for receptions of up to 400 people that might be hosted here in the building for events that happen in the building. The lobby is off of French Street, it fronts directly on the French Street, can be approached from the Paseo or along the sidewalk. When you come in, there will be a reception desk, a secure reception desk, where the populations will be segregated. Any population that is working in the Rutgers components of the building, the translational piece or the medical education piece, will go to one side and enter a secure turnstile and go to a secure bank of elevators. Uh, people who are working in the innovation and technology hub will go to a second set of bank of elevators that serve only their, those floors again through a secure entry. Everything you see in gray are the loading facilities which will come off of Kirkpatrick Street and all of the mechanical service vaults and chemical storage rooms. There is a, a, a very ample bike storage facility with an entrance off of that service road and all of that will be indoors protected and covered. Floors two through four are dedicated to the Rutgers Translational Research Program. The research, Translational Research Program is primarily wet bench research. There will be 80 principal investigators that Mr. Palladino has already alluded to uh, that are being hired now by the university and will come and occupy space here. 60 of those researchers will be dedicated to wet bench research 20 of them will be devoted to dry bench or computational research. And each of the three floors accommodates both of those types of research. The lightest green, the most vibrant green here are the wet benches themselves. The perimeter are the write-up desks that the uh, bench technicians will use to uh, compile the results of their experiments. The perimeter in the office space are the private investigators' offices, 
and this yellow space is the communal space on each floor. All three floors are connected by a central stair. There are conference rooms that flank that as well as soft seating spaces. And these light green areas here to the north and there to the west are where the dry bench researchers do their work in proximity with the wet bench researchers. A lot of the new, new science that is happening involves both dry bench and wet bench research, so that proximity is very important. I will label this a six. And floors five through eight are the real um, active heart of the building uh, in terms of people coming and going, in terms of the students that will be educated here. As Mr. Palladino has already alluded to, this will be the first and second year uh, medical school component of the, the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. This is where the students receive their education before and as they go into the hospital to do their clinical uh, their clinical time. The floor is organized with the big uh, communal spaces to the north and that big glass window that I showed you looking at the aerial uh, that you can see from the train and from uh, above the campus uh, to the north. Uh, when one comes off of the elevator there's a reception area here shown in yellow where it contains conference rooms and support space for the reception. And then that whole space opens up into this forum. This is the active informal gathering space for the medical education component. It has a stadium stair that animates that front facade and provides access to go to an upper floor. But before we go there, I want to highlight that this is the primary gathering and meeting space for the whole medical school. It contains a single room here in the east the southeast corner that can accommodate up to 400 people for a, a guest lecture. It can be broken down by a movable partition in the middle to two 200 person rooms and it can be laid out in various alternate formats to suit the medical education as well as public lectures that are sponsored by the translational research component. So this floor is a real uh, mixing bowl. In the southwest corner there is a dedicated interactive classroom that's a technology-enabled learning environment for those first-year students where they can do all kinds of computer simulations of the various courses that they're doing, that they're learning in their first and second year. These smaller rooms are breakout rooms, small seminar rooms that accommodate 12 to 15 people for group study and group seminar. I will label this a set. As we go up to the sixth floor, we find this open space, that forum is a tall, 30 foot high open space, so it's the real dramatic space that becomes the center and the heart, not only of the medical school, but the entire building. And as we arrive at the top of that stadium stair, we have the student government component and meditation and wellness rooms. In this blue area, we have the medical school student affairs and registrar's office in the yellow, and more seminar rooms, breakout rooms uh, in this kind of peach color. All of this, and these, of course, these large 400 person room and the 200 person interactive technology classroom are all double height spaces as well, so they're 30 feet tall as well. This is a eight. There's yet another stair at the top of that stadium stair if you continue up and in this northeast corner, northwest corner of the building, you come to the library, which is shown in blue. This is where medical school students study individually and together. And then uh, all in gray along here on the west side are the gross anatomy labs where uh, the 
first and second year students get their first taste of, of really working on, uh, on organs and physical parts of the body. In the east side, in the light purple, are the clinical skills simulation labs where medical school students learn to do exams, they learn to do consultation, they learn to uh, do medical techniques on people that are in distress, and so all of those simulation labs are here, and the school envisions doing some pretty exciting things with outreach uh, regarding uh, different parts of the kind of medical technology system that can come here and learn new skills through the simulation lab. This will be a state-of-the-art simulation lab here to the east. This is A9. And then the last medical education level is the upper levels of the library here shown in blue. You get here with a connecting steer that comes up uh, from here to land here. It overlooks the lower part of the library. It contains a classroom and various small study rooms as well as open carrels in the upper level of the library. This level will also include in this white space the chancellor's suite and in this yellow space the dean's suite of administrative office and conference rooms. This will be exhibit A10. And then the third component of the building, which occupies uh, floors 9 through uh, 11, are three floors of the innovation and co-working component of the building. Like below, this green area will offer some bench <coughs> research space, rented out kind of by the bench or by the group of benches as well as their wet bench support space in the dark green here. In the yellow and these other pastel colors, there are dry bench co-working spaces, which again can be rented by the desk or by the studio. There's a reception area for there. This, this whole research environment here is for the startup company, the same as the translational research below. And then in these blue colors, one of the most exciting things about this is these startup companies that are literally incubating right out of the translational research will be in direct proximity to our core partners. There are some commercial lease spaces in the building where companies and uh, entities want to be immediately close to this groundbreaking research and they will be able to rent space in this building as well. Again, that occupies floors 9, 10, and 11. I'll label it Exhibit A11. And then I'll close with a view from the train itself, not so much an aerial view, but a similar view from the north. And now having taken you all the way up through the building, you can see the active market hall here, the front entry off of French Street the three floors of translational medicine, and then we open up to this big forum that's two stories high, and then the library, which is also two stories high, those are demarcated on the building, and then the three floors of the co-working space as well. So one can stand here at the corner of the train station, at the corner of Albany and French Street, and look up, and you can see the stadium stair, you can see the library, you can see all of that activity that's happening, in that medical education component. Those large classrooms are expressed here on the eastern facade of the building. And then at the top is that last translational research floor and the rather tall penthouse with all that mechanical equipment in it. I will label this A12 and conclude my presentation. Uh, if I might, before the board might have questions for, for Mr. Martin, I think Mr. Palladino wants to provide a brief supplement to that testimony. I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, the bike storage area will also have locker rooms with showers, so people who are making bicycles to work, uh, it's kind of important to note. Um, 
Uh, Mr. Martin talked about the public spaces in the building, the, um, uh, the market hall. Um, I think something that's really important is what we try to do with every, with every project is that this will be a very public space. It'll be open to the public, other, not just Rutgers and our core partners being able to use this for events, but other community uh, organizations use this for events. And the public plaza, we really do um, intend to manage it much like we do the yard at Rutgers and actually creating events, creating music events, creating exercise events, and really letting it be a place where people can gather in the city, kind of in a safe, exciting um, uh, uh, place. Uh, with respect to the simulation labs, you know, we have talked with Rutgers uh, over, a number, over a number of years on another thing, even another practice, is that not only will these, these simulation labs be used by Rutgers for, uh, for the medical students, but for continuing education for the doctors in the hospital system, the entire Robert Johnson Barnabas system, not just UH here in New Brunswick, nurses and other um, uh, medical uh, services and med medical professionals. In addition, for us to be able to bring first responders in, the New Jersey State Police, the Port Authority Police, the New York City Police, the New Brunswick Police Fire Departments, to actually get advanced simulation training. Right now, a lot of our first responders have to get that type of uh, disaster um, uh, training they actually go to either Atlanta or to Houston, and we'll be able to do that here in New Brunswick. Um, I think that's, uh, that's also what I want to go Thanks. Members of the board, if you wish to direct any questions uh, to, to oh, Mr. Oh, I know. Rose. Rose. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no, it, it's, I think it's important, and I didn't mention it the first time, is that in addition to Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health, EDA, um, <clears throat> Hackensack Meridian, Princeton, uh, we have already uh, attracted the attention and have created two memorandums of understanding collaboration with two um, international universities. So the University of Tel Aviv has a partnership with Rutgers and they're going to be headquartered here doing uh, partnership re research with Rutgers that they've already started, a lot of it around COVID. And then um, the governor and I signed a memorandum of understanding with the Atlantic Technology Institute in Ireland. And when we open, they're going to send, from their incubator program, five uh, startup companies, all dealing in the medical device area, to actually be some of our first residents. So, and that would become, in both Tel Aviv, the University of Tel Aviv, and uh, the Irish University, this is where those companies would set up their US headquarters. And I think this is probably that's pretty exciting. Uh, the board wishes to direct any questions uh, to uh, Ms. Martin. Uh, seeing none at this time, thanks. I would call Mr. Dan Desario for testimony. <laughs> no, I'm good, thank you. Please state your name and last name for the record. Certainly, Dan. Last name is Desario, D I S A R I O. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Desario, you are a licensed uh, uh, engineer in the state of New Jersey with a discipline in uh, traffic engineering? Yes. Uh, and in that capacity, you had an opportunity to provide a traffic statement uh, after review of this plan uh, to the planning board, is that correct? Yes. Uh, could you go give the board the benefit of your professional experience and your uh, qualifications? Certainly. As stated, I am a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey as well as several other states. I've been accepted as an expert in the field of traffic engineering before hundreds of boards throughout New Jersey, including this one, and I've prepared well over a thousand traffic studies for almost every conceivable land use. Uh, I would offer. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Sarah, just to, <clears throat> as an overview, if you could provide the the charge that you were given and uh, the uh, the methodology, and then your statement of conclusions with respect to your traffic review. Certainly, I don't have any pretty pictures like the architect did, <laughs> um, but I think a lot of my thunder has already been stolen. As you heard from Mr. Kelso, this project is consistent with the Re Ferrandec redevelopment plan. We're not seeking any relief uh, as it relates to any aspects of this site, including the traffic aspects, specifically with respect to parking. You've heard from the engineer as well. Uh, as the rest of the team, the parking will be provided by the wellness deck, which is um, basically across the street from the project site. I think what's important from a pure traffic uh, perspective as well as uh, pedestrian circulation perspective is that 
couple things. This project's bringing essentially an extension of Church Street, even though on the applicants indicated it's going to be private for purposes of ownership and maintenance. But that's just going to enhance the circulation in this part of the city. It's going to continue that grid network that already exists. I'm sure most, if not everyone in this room, remembers when this was Farron Deck. It's kind of like driving through a tunnel. Um, and sometimes, if you are new to the city, it was pretty intimidating, this section of the city. Deck is down. We've been looking at a construction site for quite a long time. Um, it's been a little difficult to walk around the site, quite frankly. Um, but with this project, you've heard with the plaza that's going to be created, um, what wasn't specifically stated but is part of the plan, the sidewalks around this first phase are all going to be upgraded um, to current standards with proper handicap ramps. Everyone's aware that the county project is under construction right now. That's going to essentially extend Spring Street, so there will be a four-way intersection uh, with the uh, traffic signal, um, which is going to enhance circulation in this part of the city. Um, I think when you look at it in, to in total, this project's going to continue to provide um, an enhancement in terms of pedestrian circulation in this part of the city. Um, you've heard we don't have any driveways other than the one that's proposed for the service portion of the building um, to the west southwest corner of the site. So we are not introducing any new curb cuts other than the one for loading, which I also think is a positive. In conclusion, you've heard from uh, the witnesses before me, but if I were to ask you, we want to do a building in the city that's going to basically have synergies with the hospital and the university, where would you want to put it? When I look at it from a pure circulation perspective, I think this is an ideal location. It's across the street from the train station. So people coming to this building, a lot of them are going to be affiliated with the university. A lot of them are going to be affiliated with the hospital. A lot of them are going to live in the city and are going to be able to walk to this site. Um, a lot of them are going to be students at here, as you've heard. A lot of the students at the university live in the city and they walk to the university. I think this is an ideal location for this type of facility. And being across from the train station, it's going to allow people that work in this location to not only live in the city, but they could live elsewhere too and take the train into the city and then quite easily walk across the street. I think this is an ideal location um, from a pure traffic and pedestrian circulation pers perspective, in particular because it is across from the train station and it's close to the hospital and the university. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Thank you. That four-way intersection that you mentioned on Spring Street, that's the Spring Corner of Spring and Patterson? And French Street. So it's Easton, okay. French, and then Spring Street's going to be extended. The four-way intersection is actually Spring Street and Route 27. Okay. Yep. And so at that point, you will be able to come out of the church, out of church Street or the Church Street decks, <clears throat> make a right-hand turn, and decide to go straight up Easton Avenue. Okay. Go left to go south on Route 27 or go right up north and coming in you can come in and from Easton Avenue come all the way across go up uh, Spring Street and go to Patterson or Bayer. So like right now and I think it's a great idea George Street is closed right you have the outdoor dining it's pretty cool. In the future somebody if the city elects to keep that going which I hopefully you do for selfish reasons I like to dine in the city but you could come up Church Street and then you'll be able to get to the connector and access French Street and Easton Avenue at the existing traffic signal. So this is the county project. They're cr creating that fourth leg, the existing three-leg intersection. Okay. Really a great thing for this part of the city to see happen. And even though there's no parking associated with this, there's an agreement that the parking will be provided at existing decks. But your conclusion is that no significant impact, impact on, on uh, traffic in the central portion. Elsewhere. Correct. And if you look at it historically, this site was a fair and deck. It had retail on the ground floor. I remember Marita's Cantina. There was a Mongolian barbecue place. So when you look at it historically, 
we're not really changing what historically the city experienced in terms of traffic. And, and, and if anything, it's going to be an improvement because of the extension of Church Street and then the introduction of that fourth leg that the county's doing at that existing signal. If there are no further questions, uh, members of the board, that completes our presentation. start the clock, uh, I wanted to ask if the board received my letter sent earlier today. I so, don't your letter. Okay, I sent it to the secretary. May I approach and give you sure. a copy? I did have some communication with your secretary over the weekend. And Under your rules, uh, specifically order of presentation, rule 2, colon 2-3, two um, it sets forth that uh, upon conclusion of the presentation of the application, any objectors wishing to present a case in objection to the relief sought may do so in such order as may be recognized by the chair. The next section, there is no section E, but the next section is F, and that talks about public commentary by interested parties, and uh, it says that uh, each such interested party shall be subject to a reasonable time. I've made clear in writing to the board that I'd like to be an objector for both applications tonight, and um, the part about objectors doesn't have a time limit. I don't want to prolong the meeting, but I did want to be able to, you know, introduce evidence and ask questions of the witnesses without having to do it all in five minutes. I think it's unreasonable to, re to require an objector to make their entire case in five minutes. So uh, I would ask that I be able to make that objection under... requesting relief, relief from the, our five-minute limitation on the basis of your being an objector. And will you specifically limit your, your questions and comments to the, to the application at hand? Yes, uh, but first I did have some procedural issues just to raise. Okay, uh, I have a feeling Mr. Kelso has issues. Yeah, I'd like to respond, to respond to this. <clears throat> I uh, learned of uh, Mr. Cradiville's uh, request maybe an hour before this meeting. But the fact of the matter is the intent for, for interested parties uh, is a five-minute limitation, and that is exactly what's what's in in the the uh, zoning ordinance. The problem is, Mr. Cranville is trying to utilize the technicality of being classified as an objector in order to gain more time for him to make comment that may or may not be germane to this application. This is a redevelopment uh, application with a redeveloper in accordance with a plan that's fully compliant. So in order for me to have the ability to, to respond to what he's attempting to do, I'd like him to tell us what his objections are. 
Otherwise, I think the board has to see him as nothing more than an interested party. He doesn't live within 200 feet. I don't believe he owns property in New Brunswick. He's a candidate for, for public office. He has other reasons to attempt to use this forum as a place to be able to make a speech. If he has legitimate objections that go to the heart of this plan, in a plan that is fully compliant with the redevelopment plan, then I think he should tell us what they are. Because otherwise, he may be raising issues that aren't properly before the planning board. The planning board has jurisdiction over certain things, but it doesn't have jurisdiction over everything. So I object that Mr. Craddeville wants to use the benefit of my client's conforming application to do statements, make statements, do things that don't really relate to this application. So let him state what his objections are, and if he has a legitimate objection that runs to the applications itself, then he can, he can state as what his objections are. Otherwise, he should be limited to the five minutes like everybody else. And your response to that, Charlie? I'd be happy to explain a little bit. And uh, thing, it, yeah. it has been made clear that this is really in complete compliance with what the board has previously approved as redevelopment plan back in uh, January? No. Uh, what, 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 mixing that up. I think that there was a, an amendment earlier this year to this plan, but I don't remember offhand exactly when. Yeah, so again, you know, we've limited in how what we can do as a result of that. You know, if you have substantive recommendations as to you know ways that this could improve the product, that sort of thing, then maybe board members will want to hear it, that sort of thing. But it really isn't a good time to just bring in extraneous things which are not relevant to this. Sure. Are you, is that acceptable? Yeah, I think you should tell us what those objections are. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the, the first objection is the, con the, the way the board is constituted, um, and, and I can explain further. And then the second issue is, is regarding the contamination. I'm concerned about the contamination. Uh, I appreciate the applicant's presentation, and uh, you know they did acknowledge the off-site contamination. I had some questions about it, some evidence I wanted to introduce yeah, about it. five minutes to do that. And it's a legitimate question to ask, but it's not an objection. Well, they were not limited to five minutes. You the know, rules make it clear objectors, you know, should be able to have the time to introduce evidence. And I don't have a ton of it. I won't be long-winded. He's like, stating that he, that he's stating that he wants to object, but now what he's stating is he's interested in the information. Let him ask the question. He's got five minutes to ask it. We'll answer. Let's start with the. Five minutes to see how it goes, Charlie. How okay. Well, how about before that, can I raise again, the, the two things that you mentioned? You know, I don't know if I see that as particularly relevant to the uh, to the board's deliberation tonight. Just from what I heard so far. Fair, fair enough. I I, I will just briefly state my concern about the um, membership of the board. So, I, I object to that. What, what does that have to do with the applicant's application before the board? It's extraneous. It I'm not sure I do, but I, either. However, we are given Charlie five minutes here to speak his piece. Okay, he's using it up. Go ahead. And, okay. well, and may I call sorry. a witness? Sorry, sorry. Sure, sure. If he's an interested party, he has five minutes to speak. If he's going to call a witness, the witness is part of his five minutes. That's not what I was told by board counsel. I was told that uh, any witness would get five minutes as well. Um, nevertheless, own. that's not what the rules say. On their own, if they come and they want to express uh, comment on the application, they get their five minutes. How about that, Charlie? You give your five minute presentation, and then this other person could present, have five minutes to present their case also. As well, well, I don't want to seem obstructive. I'm saying any interested party has a right to speak for five minutes. But, but it's I, not orchestrating it as a result of him being an objector and being able to bring people and ask them questions. I have a statutory right to cross-examine the witnesses, and I, I have a right to be an objector. You don't need to have a lawyer to be an objector. So under your rules, I should be allowed to be an objector, and I should be allowed to call a witness, and I'll reveal the only witness I would like to call would be Dan Dominguez to speak to him about the, the issue with the board members. So, 
Well, just to, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Rather than dancing around it, what exactly is your objection to the constitution of the board? Why don't we start with that? Thank you for, for allowing just me say to, to just say it. Just, just say what it is. Yeah, so I have the, the planning board website here. States class four, six other citizens of the city to be appointed by the mayor. Quote, the members of class four hold no other municipal office. Among the class four members are Zachary Wright and Matthew Ferguson, my two favorite board members, but they don't they do hold other municipal office, is, is my understanding. So I'm I'm trying to square that with, with what's on the city website and the, you know the, the way the board is constituted. I don't know what office they hold, and if in fact it is a city office by definition. Again, I don't know what this has to do with the application. I have, the, I just I have put that for you. Zoning, zoning board and housing authority. I understand him to be suggesting that they're not eligible to vote. Is that accurate? I, I'm suggesting, according to the city website, that they yes, should not be class four members of, of the planning board. And so if, if that's true, which is why I wanted to ask Mr. Dominguez. And you are therefore suggesting they aren't eligible to vote? Is that the consequence of your argument? If, if, if this is true, what's on the city website, then yeah, they should not be class four members of the planning board. Uh, well, I, I would only say what's what's on the website isn't the statute. It's not it's not anything from from my view that's reciting what the law is. And, and, and then maybe wrong. That's a question for the chair to determine. And if the chair determines that they're eligible to vote, then they're eligible to vote. These members have served well for some time now. I don't see any reason why they couldn't continue to serve as board members and vote on this particular application. So I, I can't accept that, Your Honor. Okay. Um, I, I would raise one other issue about the constitution of the board that uh, uh, Ms. Sikora Ludwig has come out in support of this project and uh, been uh, loud and proud about it, and that uh, uh, in light of that, she should recuse herself from tonight's vote. I, I can't agree with that either, Charlie. Um, but we have served on this board for well, long before I came along. You know, and and um, I don't know if we can control how, what people say about projects. I, I don't know if I agree with that. Okay. I appreciate your raising these concerns and objections uh, uh, for us to consider, but uh, I can't accept that tonight. All right. I, I appreciate you giving me the chance to explain those. And, uh, yeah. For the record, I, I do object to a time limitation if you are going to put one on my, my remaining remarks. Um, I think we are. Okay. Duly noted. Um, may I cross-examine uh, the witnesses? Uh, like the, Mr. Roche and Mr. Palladino? I just object to the characterization of cross-examine. He can ask them questions. It's the the statutory has, right. That's, I'm saying the same thing, Charlie. Just calm down. He has a right to ask questions of the witnesses. He's got five minutes to do it. You're within your five minutes. I'm sorry? I said you're still within your, correct? Yes. I ask you questions. Okay. So uh, for Mr. Roche, you mentioned the two off-site sources of contamination. Isn't it true that uh, one of them is it's no longer a dry cleaners, it's a restaurant and uh, Robert Wood Johnson is in charge of the cleanup. It is. Okay. Um, I, did, may I introduce evidence, or is that, am I not an objector? You're within your five minutes. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I'd like to introduce this into evidence. Um, for you. Can you tell the board what that is? Yes. So this is a letter to the county engineer, July 21, 2017, uh, from CME Associates regarding the contamination at the site. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Palladino about this situation here. Um, the letter concludes by stating, it's my professional opinion as the LSRP of record that the existing site conditions warrant the declaration of an emergency conditions and completion of expedited removal actions in order to mitigate the current hazards. And earlier in the letter, it cites DevCo's contractor has excavating approximately 50 cubic yards of contaminated soil and stockpiled the material directly on the adjacent ground. It says excavated soils were not placed atop plastic sheeting. 
nor has the soil stockpile been covered with plastic sheeting. I want to understand if Mr. Palladino can tell us uh, about this emergency situation, what led to it, and what assurances we have that the contamination has not spread to this site um, where, where the development is proposed. Mr. Chair, I've never seen this site. I don't think any of I will note copied on the, the letter is Thomas F. Kelso in his capacity as Middlesex County Council. Um, and uh, that the county did lead the cleanup and that they did hire a contractor uh, to do this emergency cleanup. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know, um, you know what came of it. And maybe Mr. Roach knows more. Let me, let me give you my response to that. The, the overall site had contamination, still has contamination. The analysis that the LSRP did for DEVCO and the LSRP for the County of Middlesex had to do a long-term analysis of where the plume of the spill was that came from the County Administration Building and had to isolate where it was and then to identify what type of remediation or mitigation would take place. That letter is 2017. It's now 2022. The county, the, this particular location where this building is being done has been remediated to the extent that all contaminated soil has been removed as well as all the contaminated soil on the balance of the site, which you see as phase two, which is where the primary plume was. The only thing left as far as the county's LSRP is aware is there needs to be four wells where there's going to be injections of chemicals to mitigate groundwater contamination. There's a total of four of those that are scheduled uh, four months apart and from what I'm understanding that there may not even be a need for four. So that all of that county contamination has been contained, all the soil has been removed over a period of years from an independent contractor and what's left here is what was testified to by Chris Roach, which is a remediation of where the, I think it's where the uh, dry cleaner was. I'm no expert in this stuff, but my understanding, you know, having off-site plumes that migrate into the, a, a project, there's nothing at all that unusual about that. And these are just, you know, part of the whole remediation process that has to occur prior to construction. I think that being addressed at this time. Okay. It's largely been addressed. One other. One item. minute. Thank you. So these are uh, three figures. Uh, Lewis Berger is the contractor that produced them, apparently for Devco. And I do want to just draw attention to the plume. Um, and I'll note that uh, the plume lines up with the area that's not being developed at this time. Uh, and uh, appears to, to spare the, uh, the area for development. And I just wanted to ask if uh, Mr. Paladino, if it's fair to say that the, the main reason we're here tonight on only part of this site is the residual contamination from the... I'm going to answer no. that's not accurate. I already explained that the remediation of that bloom, that the soil has been removed and there's only the injection wells left. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree, sure. I don't think it's been addressed. Well, if, if, if we were prepared to move forward with the second phase at the moment, we would have been here with an application. Okay. So there's an ongoing process that's being marshaled by the county. We're confident. We have our own LSRP who's giving us advice, making sure everything is being done appropriately. Um, and we've had this uh, very good partnership with the county and the city to make sure that the site's been cleaned up. Thank you. If I may just ask, uh, finally, I did not see a bus shelter on the plans, and I would respectfully request that the board make it a condition of approval uh, for there to be some uh, shelter for people to catch the bus. This is a very uh, popular stop for people catching intercity buses as well as Coach USA buses, and uh, just respectfully would ask them to include that in the, in the proposal. Chair, uh, um, there is no place on our site to put a bus stop, but as part of this um, reconfiguration uh, where there is this island, um, it, I believe that it's the intention of uh, that to become a bus stop because there is the carve out uh, that also gets the buses kind of away from uh, the site just a bit. And I'm not aware, although I will follow up, uh, as if the county uh, actually intended to build a bus stop. 
a, a shelter. Okay. Hope to see that. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Who's next? M-O-O-R-E. Yes, I do. Well, first I would just like to start off with, wow, seeing a lot of high-rise buildings due to where I'm a resident, been here 45 years all my life due to where, wow, I know 20 years, almost 20 years ago, Mayor Cahill said, wow, the reason for knocking down Memorial Parkway was because he didn't want any high-rise buildings in New Brunswick because it's a fire hazard. Not saying that I don't enjoy seeing the upgrade, but being lied to, the public where it went to the newspaper and all, instead of saying, wow, I think it's time for New Brunswick to do an upgrade, instead of him lying, saying we don't want any high-rise buildings in New Brunswick because it's a fire hazard. And like I said, very sad that we have a mayor that lies so much. Next thing I will say, sad to say, it seems like, wow, French Street, Somerset Street, wow, pretty soon we'll be going all to, to what, Rutgers, Rutgers University, Robert Wood Johnson, wow, because all of you want money in your pockets where you don't care about the residents who are living here, where, wow, I will say with all this construction work due to why I'm on Somerset Street, Wow, what are we going through in the area? Wow, with rats, with all, the, with all this digging going on, with all this construction, rats as big as the size of my foot running up and down the road in broad daylight. Please, do you really think about the residents or this is about money in your pockets? Not saying whether this will be a good idea, but wow, how many construction sites do you have going on regards to Rutgers and Robert Wood Johnson at one time? Please, like I said, wow, this is, it, 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 I, I know it used to be what called sort of a city of New Brunswick, but I guess you can call this the city of, and what, Robert Wood Johnson and Rutgers University due to where what? You're taking everything. For this project to be, to be done, if this was the case for you to change your mind of what was the first plan on this, why didn't you put the cancer center here instead of tearing down a school, a very good school, putting a, a, a kids in danger at 50 Jersey Avenue where what? How much crime you have, how many people you have killed over there in the past month? How much crime is over there? You could have put the cancer center there instead of putting those kids over there, 50 Jersey Avenue by railroad tracks. Please, money's not going to be there to save you in every way. You better think, you guys better think about doing the right thing because the Lord is really watching you. Everything's about money to you guys. Instead of doing the right thing for the residents in New Brunswick and, and stop thinking about what Rutgers and Robert Wood Johnson, then my safety quest, my, due to where I'm a person where I follow up with safety, please, with, the, with French Street, I know it's a situation now, but when you, please tell me when you get your project started, is that side of French Street going to be closed? At, may I get an answer? Uh, yeah, uh, it's all sort of the same thing on Somerset Street with, with Plum Street due to where you cannot walk on that side. During construction. You mean temporarily on, closed? Yes, with, with the construction going on. We have not submitted our construction um, logistics plan yet to the city, and um, which we'll, we'll review that with them, and if possible, keep it open. Well, please do, because one reason why I say, and I pointed out before, even with the, with the county, with the, well, when they were fixing the sidewalks, if you do plan on closing the road, the, the sidewalk off there, please put your sign up towards Joyce Cummer Avenue and French Street and say the sidewalk is closed where the pedestrians can walk with the walkway and the light instead of walking down to French and Kirkpatrick Street due to where you have to cross under the railroad tracks. No one's there to guide the pedestrians to have to cross the street there. So for safety, please, I, like I said, as a person due to where I'm, I'm concerned, I hope you do look into that. Please, thank you. Thanks for your advice. So is, is there anyone else providing, asking questions or providing any statements? Hearing none. I just ask a question. Are there, sure. Were there any recommendations or requirements that the planning board had previously specified for this, and were those considered? It? Sorry, I didn't prepare you for this. Sorry. 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 
anything that the board had brought up uh, would that would have been factored into the plan as part of uh, the amendment when it was uh, or the approval when it was initially done. Off the top of my head, I, I can't think of any specific one for this project. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for from uh, uh, board members or board professionals? Entertain a motion. Are there conditions? <coughs> Excuse me. Are there conditions there? <laughs> that, that was me. Are there any conditions prior to the vote? Uh, yes. Uh, should the board act favorably on this application, we recommend the following conditions. Uh, compliance with the terms of the city engineer report dated July 1st, 2022. Um, payment of a site performance bond and an amount reviewed and approved by the city engineer. Submission of a site inspection escrow deposit for engineering inspection fees and an amount calculated pursuant to Title 13, uh, sorry, 16, 21, 160. Payment of all water and sewer connection fees. Um, issuance of a road opening permit from the city engineer required. The applicant shall schedule pre-construction meeting with the city engineering department. Compliance with the terms of the Vignell Consulting Group report dated July 8, 2022. Payment of any redeveloper fee if applicable to the City of New Brunswick. Planning review escrow funded for anticipated post approval reviews. Payment of any other fees due to the City of New Brunswick related to the development or use of the project. Payment of all outstanding taxes and water sewer fees. Middlesex County Planning Board approval or waiver. Freehold Soil Conservation District approval or waiver. Any other outside approval or waiver as required. Um, submission of engineering and or architectural plans comply with any changes required by the planning or engineering memos or plan amendments offered in the hearing, if any. Execution of a Title 39 parking enforcement agreement. Um, compliance with the city's water service system ordinance. Trash and recycling pickup to be provided by a private hall at no expense to the city. Um, all utilities and other site improvements to be maintained by the applicant at their sole expense. All on site utilities to be constructed underground. All temporary encroachments and public right of way shall require city council approval. All construction staging shall be done on site unless an encroachment allowing that the public right of way is, is approved by city council. The street shall be kept clean of sediment and debris. The applicant shall cause the streets to be cleaned or directed to do so by the director of public works. Um, replacement of damaged streets, curves, and sidewalks for the direction of the city engineer. And the applicant is seeking a preliminary and final site plan. Motion to approve with the aforementioned conditions. Second. Uh, who seconded? Anthony. Can you Yolitza Checo? Yes. Matt Ferguson? Yes. Zanzi Cora Ludwig? Yes. Ivan Adorno? Yes. Zach Wright? Yes. Nikki Mione? Yes. Evan Hoagland? Yes. Bob Carter? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe we can take five minutes for a uh, rest stop. I stay for <laughs> Okay, we have one additional project uh, among the public, public hearings for today. This is uh, R B F and B Urban Renewal LLC. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I am um, the court reporter, and I'm interrupting you because apparently. It's my machine's not working right now. Oh, okay. Uh, just so one second, please. It, this is this is not. Um... <laughs> All right, let's give you a minute. Take your time. Thank you. You good? I'm good. That's great. Okay. So the second uh, application we have under our public hearings today is RTFNB Urban Renewal LLC. Address 4555 US Highway Number One at 35 Labor Center Way, Block 
Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. My husband says he can hear me from down the street, so <laughs> not a compliment. Um, all right, so good evening, everybody. I am Kate Coffey from Dave Pitney. I'm here tonight on behalf of the applicant, RTFNB Urban Renewal LLC, which is the designated redeveloper of the property that the chairman described, uh, located at 45 through 55 US Highway 1 and 35 Labor Center Way. The properties are Block 710, Lot 7.02, 7.03, and 7.04, and Block 707.01, Lot 35.13. Um, we are located in the Sears Redevelopment Plan area. As the chairman indicated, we are seeking preliminary and final major subdivision approval. Um, we are taking the four-lot property and dividing it into eight lots. Those lots consist of an approximately 7.88 acre lot, which uh, is shown on our plans as lot 7.041. Approximately 9.07 acre lot, which is shown as lot 7.042. An approximately 5.05 .05 acre lot, which is shown as lot 35.131. An approximately 6.61 .61 acre lot, which is shown as lot 35.132. An approximately 3.5 acre lot, which is shown as lot 7.043. An approximately 1.01 .01 acre lot, which is shown as lot 7.031. And an approximately 1.55 acre lot, which is shown as lot 0.7032. There are no changes proposed to the configuration of existing lot 7.02, which is approximately 1.87 acres. In connection with the subdivision, the applicant is seeking relief from sections 35 and 36 of the Municipal Land Use Law, which requires that each lot abut a previously approved street or public road. We have um, lots that do not abut a public road, but will have access to the public road via the private roads within the proposed development and pursuant to a common resources easement agreement. As the chairman also indicated, we are seeking preliminary and final site plan approval. What's being proposed is we'll be demolishing the existing improvements on the property, which you probably all know is currently a vacant Sears. Um, but we are retaining two restaurant pads that exist on the property today. It's an On the Border and a Hulahans. So it's anyone's favorites, they'll still be there. Um, in addition to that, we're constructing two mixed-use buildings, which include rental apartments with ground floor, retail space, and restaurants, stacked townhomes, a retail pad, and a restaurant pad, along with associated parking, lighting, landscaping, signage, and other associated improvements. So specific to the, the lots that we propose to be subdivided, on lot 7.041, the applicant is proposing to construct the first of the two five-story mixed-use buildings. It will include approximately 268 residential rental units, 9,186 square feet of retail space, There'll be 353 parking spaces, which include ground and basement level parking that are dedicated to the residential users, 14 spaces that are dedicated to the retail, and 129 shared parking spaces. On 7042, it's the second of the mixed use buildings, also five stories, approximately 262 rental un residential rental units, 11,133 square feet of retail space, and 297 parking spaces, 
which again uh, include, excuse me, 297 parking spaces that are de dedicated to the residential uses, including ground and basement level parking, 16 spaces dedicated to the retail use, and 70 shared parking spaces. On proposed lots 35, 131, and 132, lot 35.132 that is, the applicant's proposing to construct 190 for sale stacked townhomes that will be in a total of 16 buildings. Each of the townhome units has a driveway parking space as well as a garage parking space. And in addition to those parking spaces, there are 112 shared on-street parking spaces. On lot 7031, the applicant's proposing an approximately 3,556 square foot retail or restaurant use with a drive through and 28 parking spaces. And finally, on lot 7043, the applicant's proposing to construct one single-story retail building with approximately 23,256 square feet and 180 dedicated surface parking spaces along with landscaping and signage that would be suitable to a grocer. We are seeking some, we need no variance relief from the redevelopment plan. We do, however, require design waiver relief from the redevelopment plan. This relief includes um, a waiver from ordinance section 17.07040, subsection A, 4BI, which requires street trees on all frontages to be spread out an average of 50 feet with a maximum spacing of 70 feet between trees. So we have a comprehensive landscaping plan um, with really robust planting, which includes over 344 shade trees, 300 of which are street trees. However, we do not provide street trees between the townhouse driveways um, because it gets to be a maintenance dispute between neighbors whose tree is it to trim and water, et cetera. Um, and shade trees are not provided between the retaining wall and the roadway along the eastern property line. And also the northern roadway of the multifamily buildings, there are some areas where the spacing between the trees exceeds 70 feet, but we are happy to coordinate with municipal, the municipal professionals on spacing. We also require a waiver from ordinance section 1707 070C1D, which requires that the periphery of all buildings be landscaped with shrubs and trees. All of the proposed buildings are landscaped per the ordinance, except for areas that have decorative pavement or building along the building facade. Um, and those include building G and portions of building C. We need a waiver from ordinance section 1707-070C2K which requires at least 10% of the gross parking area of any parking lot to be landscaped. The majority of our parking lots meet that standard. However, um, we need relief for building C um, and building A, which are slightly lower than 10%. We need a waiver from ordinance section 1707-070-C2H, which requires a five-foot landscape buffer between parking areas and property lines. We have an existing non-conformity on the site that, that's there today on the western portion of the property where there is a, a curb line um, that's one foot and six inches from there. So we can't maintain the buffer, the five foot buffer in that location. And lastly, we need a waiver from ordinance section 1707-070-C2H, which requires a 10 foot landscape buffer between parking lots and public right of ways. We are providing the 10 foot buffer. However, there's a prescribed mix of planting which we deviate from um, with regard to shrubs that are being proposed. Um, the redevelopment plan does require a 100-foot buffer between the proposed development and the Cotter Drive Dewey Heights neighborhood, which the applicant is observing. And we are in the process of identifying dead and diseased trees within that buffer to be removed and replaced with hardier plants that are more likely to thrive and fill out that buffer area. Um, we've had several meetings with the neighbors in that community, and as part of those meetings, the applicant would agree to a condition um, if it were to be approved, requiring the applicant to enter into a buffer maintenance agreement with the city for the maintenance of the 100-foot buffer between the development and that Cotter Drive Dewey Heights neighborhood. Um, with us this evening, we have Sean Savage of Matrix New World Engineering. He's the project engineer. David Minow of Minow Wasco, who is the project architect. And Matthew Seckler from Stonefield Engineering, who is the project traffic engineer. We also have Jason Tronco of Melillo and Bauer, who's the landscape architect, who's available to answer questions should the board have any with respect to the proposed landscaping. 
If it's acceptable, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that Mr. Savage join us and um, introduce himself and be sworn in. Please proceed. Thank you. Savage, you can please state your name and so your last name for the record. Sean Savage, S A V A G E. Can you swear from the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, Mr. Savage, can you please introduce yourself to the board and the public and tell them about your experience and credentials? Okay. I'm a licensed uh, civil engineer in the state of New Jersey. Been practicing for around 25 years. Uh, haven't testified here before, but have testified in numerous towns and cities throughout New Jersey. We'd ask that Mr. Savage be accepted as a professional engineer and be qualified to provide expert testimony. So accepted. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Mr. Savage, can you please walk us through the location of the property? And I, here. I, I think so. Okay. Thank you. Mr. date of this, this is a plan, it's a colored rendering entitled Conceptual Site Plan A1.1. Uh, it's dated 7 11 22. And we'll mark that as Exhibit A1, correct? Okay, so um, you got a, a good background of all the uh, lots and existing proposed lots, just to kind of orient to the property. Um, the property here is located, has frontage on, on Route 1 and Phelps Avenue. Uh, Route 1 is to the south, Phelps Avenue and Labor Center Way are to the, to the north. Um, the site is, has um, the, the Rutgers uh, administrative building located uh, to the west. It has um, some residential apartments uh, to the north, uh, west, and then some residential single family um, to the uh, north and east. Um, the entrances of the site, uh, we're going to be maintaining the existing entrances. There's two uh, right in, right out only on Route 1, and there's a, a, a full access entrance drive um, at Phelps Avenue and Labor Center Way. Those are all to remain. Um, previously mentioned, we're going to uh, be proposing 198 stacked town townhome units will be located up here in the in the north section of the site, uh, located within 16 buildings. Um, each of these units will have a garage and driveway combination for parking, um, and um, trash and, and collection things like that will be dealt with uh, on a per unit basis. Will be you know, kept in their garage and they're rolled out for, uh, for collection. Um, the next portion of the building, uh, up here near Phelps, we're, we're going to have a dog run located uh, just to, just to the uh, south side of the entrance drive off of Phelps. Um, there's going to be, and I'll get into stormwater in a little bit, but there's a stormwater management basin located up along Phelps Avenue as well. The next part, the, the center portion of the property, um, is going to be where the mixed-use building is located. Uh, this is what's referred to as buildings A and B. Um, building uh, A is going to have 268 residential units um, within it, and then also um, with a garage parking uh, beneath that. Um, that garage parking, the entrance for building A is located up here along the uh, access aisle on the uh, is sort of on the western side of the site. Uh, you'll enter from there, you'll enter into the one level of the parking, there'll be an internal ramping to get to the second level of, of the uh, garage parking. In the middle between the two uh, A and B buildings, there's going to be amenity space here. I believe the architect recovery building is about, I think it's about 16,000 square feet, I think it was. Um, and then there's some outdoor, um, um, facilities, some shade shelters, a pool, um, and some more uh, shade shelters up there. Um, on, on the building B, uh, we have two entrances to the parking garage. The one up here on the on the north uh, west side uh, enters to the upper parking level, and the entrance down here on the um, more on the uh, east side enters at the lower level. Um, 
around the, the mixed-use building, there's a number of loading spaces that you can see here hatched. There's some over here on the, on the uh, southwest side, and there's some up here along the northern side of the buildings. Uh, those would be utilized for uh, you know, people moving in and out of the, of the buildings, uh, things such as that. So those will be restricted for that kind of parking. Um, in addition to the internal parking, we're also proposing, uh, as part of buildings A and B, there's also a retail component that's going to be located here on the, on the Route 1 frontage of each building. Um, these, as previously mentioned, in building A, there's approximately 9,200 uh, square foot of retail restaurant space. On building B, there's approximately, I think it's like about uh, 11,200 square feet of retail and um, restaurant space. And then the uh, parking that's going to be associated with those retail uses that was mentioned previously is located right here along the frontage of these of the buildings. As previously mentioned, there's 14 for the one building, 16 for the other one. Um, there's also shared parking associated with these two buildings, um, which would be located down here in between buildings A and F, and some additional shared parking up here located to the east of buildings B, in between buildings B and C. Um, as you can see, and again, the architect getting into it, but there's also more amenity space, uh, outdoor space located, um, you know, within the buildings as called, but on top of, obviously, on top of the parking uh, areas. Um, next, I'll move over to uh, Building C, which is the uh, approximately 22,300 square foot building that's sort of planned to be for a, a grocery uh, food type store. And that has um, 187 park installs associated with it. Uh, so over here. Uh, this also has um, uh, a loading, uh, loading area for the building located up here on the north uh, east side, as well as some additional trash um, collection over here on the, uh, the western, northwestern side of the site. Um, forgot to mention, but for, for the uh, mixed use buildings, uh, trash will be you know, collected internally and will be brought out um, from the building to, to uh, a location along the um, eastern side of the building, which will then be collected. So the uh, trash will be uh, dumpsters, et cetera, will be brought out to be collected. Um, I think back to that building C, I think pretty much covered that, the parking associated with that. Um, the next proposed building would be what well, we're referring to building G down here, which is the 3,500 square foot um, drive through uh, restaurant or, or, uh, or, or retail use. Uh, and that's the, that one has um, also has its own parking associated with it. The other thing is, I think we're providing 70, I think, for that, and it needed 28. And then there's the two existing buildings, the uh, F and H, which are two remaining. Um, as they currently are. Um, lastly, there's another stormwater basin that's located over here in the, in the far eastern portion of the site. Um, and and that's, that kind of covers the initial part of the site. Um, as, as mentioned, uh, the, in terms of subdivision, get used to that, the, the, the lots up here for the townhomes, those are going to be the, um, the, the um, get those lots again. 35, um, 35, 1 through 1, 35, 1 through 2, and then there's going to be the 7.041, 7.042, 7.043, and then there's 7.02, which is remaining as is, 7.031 to the new uh, drive through and 7.03 um, to for the final bill. Um, Lastly, just kind of, or not lastly, but get, get into stormwater. As, as previously mentioned, that the on site uh, currently existing conditions obviously fully developed. Uh, we're actually reducing uh, the impervious coverage um, somewhat from that existing condition. Uh, and therefore, certain aspects of the, the uh, stormwater management regulations would not be applicable, such as water quality, uh, recharge requirements, because by reducing the impervious coverage, we're we're providing, we're meeting those requirements. Um, however, because of the, you know, the existing condition, the drainage has a break, it, you know, sort of in the middle of the site. Um, but once you remove the existing buildings and, and construct the new buildings, 
you kind of change a little bit of the the direction and the break of where the water would go. So we, we have provided two stormwater management basins um, to just sort of uh, attenuate those flows and, and we have um, a number of drainage areas which flow towards generally towards Route 1 towards Phelps, none of which um, all those are being reduced um, according to the stormwater management regulations, either by certain percentages that we need to or by uh, volume and uh, rate. So, so um, in terms of that, we're, we're reducing the, the runoff leaving the site. Um, utilities, uh, we're going to be um, connecting to utilities that are located in Phelps Avenue. Um, and then we're also going to be connecting into um, some utilities down here on Clifton. Um, the sanitary sewer for the site, we're, in general, you know, you'll have the townhouse units will be flowing towards Phelps by gravity. The remainders of the site will be uh, flowing by gravity to a pump station located here east of Building B, which will then be pumped um, over to an existing sanitary system in Clifton Avenue. We've had some uh, preliminary discussions and continuing discussions with the city engineer, the water sewer department uh, concerning you know, those connections and, and existing capacity, et cetera. So um, those have been ongoing at this point. Um, the existing buildings, um, you know, they'll be reconnected to these new utilities because obviously when we're coming in here, we're, we're changing the, the existing utilities. So these existing buildings will be reconnected uh, to them. Um, and I don't know if that's kind of covers the majority of it. Yeah, almost all of it. I was just going to ask you to touch on the proposed phasing for the project in terms oh, of yes. the order that's going to be going in, please. I'm going to refer to a plan entitled phasing plan. Now, this is part of the site uh, plan set that I've submitted. I'm not sure if I need to mark this in as an exhibit, but this is sheet four of 26, which is the submitted site plan. The date. The date on this is uh, 413 of 22. Last revised 524 of 22. Uh, 524. Yes. Okay. Does, 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 it, does this need to be? If you're going to refer to it, we yeah, call okay. it too. Yeah. So um, on this exhibit, uh, A1 is going to be uh, building A of the multi, um, the mixed, the multi-use building over here, uh, and including some of the shared parking which should be out in front of it, the amenity space, and the pool and lawn area of of that uh, that building, multi-family building. Um, phase 1B would be all of the uh, stacked town homes, the 190 units located up here. I um, should mention that 1A, because of the stormwater management, would actually also include um, the stormwater management basin that's actually down here. It's kind of pretty far away, but that's actually part of the same uh, phase. Once you get into phase uh, two, that's going to be the second part of the um, multifamily building, the remaining 262 units, and the uh, drive-through building, uh, 3,500 square foot drive through building down here. And then the third phase would be the, um, the grosser 2200, uh, 22,300 square foot building located over here and its associated parking. And then we had indicated on this phasing plan the future, um, which would be you know any potential future development related to um, <coughs> existing buildings, but that's not obviously not part of this, this uh, submission. Thank you. And then we, we had a comment in the review memoranda that we received asking about the security measures that are proposed for the structured parking. Can you just explain how that will work, please, for the residents? Yep. Okay. So um, at the garage doors for the um, for these buildings, which again were located over here on the west side of building A and located on the north and east side of building B, those would have um, my understanding is they'd have roll-up doors that would be um, 
card or, or some sort of uh, access uh, limited to the, the tenants. Thank you. Mr. Savage, I know that when you were explaining the stormwater management plan for the property, you explained that the runoff will be reduced as compared to what exists today, but the, the impervious coverage on the site will also be reduced as compared to what's there today, correct? Correct, yeah, I had mentioned that, that, that um, there is a, a decrease in the impervious coverage um, you know, on the site. Thank you, and then the, the other, other comment I wanted to touch on in the review memoranda um, is there was a comment about the applicant taking on video inspection of the sanitary sewer main and also repairs of that sanitary sewer main. The applicant will take on the video inspection but cannot take on the repairs. Isn't that correct? That's my understanding, yes. Thank you. Those are all of my questions for Mr. Savage, but we're happy to have him um, take any questions from the board if you'd like, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just the question about building F and H and on the previous plan A2 that you showed, you talked about possible future development there. Yeah. Would that be limited to just possible retail development on uh, those spots? I mean, it would have to be in accordance with the, the zoning for that site. It's not, it's really just thrown in as a future. It's not part of this application. There, it, there are no plans for it. Right. If, it, if, any, if any changes were anticipated for those pads, the applicant would return to the board. My understanding is that all the roads in here are going to be told as privately owned, but that means privately maintained. Really, it doesn't mean they're just for the exclusive use of the residents here. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And, and they'll, they'll ultimately need, you know, the, uh, with the subdivision that was discussed before, you know, they'll, they'll have to be cross access easements between the sites, and, and you know, everyone within this can, can access those, those areas within the site. Another thing I think uh, maybe to explain that my understanding is that the city would own, would own and maintain the water lines, but not the sanitary and storm sewers, right? Those would, that would be the responsibility of the, that, that would be private. It's kind of weird. I, I didn't get quite Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, right, right now, this is fun. We haven't really gotten that far in that approval process oh, and those sorry. discussions, so that, that's something that might, um, that could change, but you know, the, the, in terms of the water on this property, there, there are a couple of large 20-inch water mains existing that, that come through the site and just based upon the previous layout would be underneath what would be buildings A and B. Those water mains are, are being relocated basically to run in our proposed driveway. Um, those are big, um, you know, trunk lines for water mains that this, you know, the city would want to control the sanitary, I think, is a little less, um, you know, we're just going to be collecting the, the buildings, we're going to the pump station, um, the, the applicant's going to be the maintain and own the pump station, they'll have to hire a third party for maintenance and, and such uh, running that pump station. So it's still, that's still discussions at this point in terms of that final ownership. Mr. Savage, um, we'll ask Mr. Minow to join us, please. So we'd ask that Mr. Minow please be sworn. Uh, my name is David J. Minow, M-I-N-N-O. I do. Mr. Minow, could you please introduce yourself to the board and the public and tell them about your experience and qualifications? Sure. Um, I'm president of Minow and Wasco Architects and Planners. We're about a 97-person firm located both in Lambertville, New Jersey, and Newark, New Jersey. And our firm specializes in high-density, multifamily, mixed-use projects around the state of New Jersey. Uh, I'm a registered architect in New Jersey and a planner, but tonight I'm only testifying as an architect. And I've testified in front of hundreds of boards for the last 30 years uh, in New Jersey. We'd ask that Mr. Minow be accepted as an expert in architecture and a licensed architect. Licensed architect. 
almost said licensed architecture, um, <laughs> not quite a building, um, and uh, that he'd be allowed to provide testimony. Accepted. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Mr. Minow, tell us about the buildings that are being proposed. Sure. I'm referring to the site plan A1. Uh, I'm primarily going to be talking tonight about buildings A and B on the site. Um, and I, I'm really pleased to present these buildings. Uh, first, we're going to see some plans, which might be a little boring, but then you're going to get to see some uh, beautiful renderings of these buildings, which um, I have to say, Russo Development is one of the top developers in the in the state, and we've been the architect of four or five projects for Russo Development, and they always go beyond uh, what we, even as architects, we expect, and they keep improving the buildings and the products and the materials. So they're in it for the long haul and uh, their buildings are really built to last. They don't cheap out on anything, either the exterior, interior, landscaping. So I'm really pleased to present this project to you because I think you'll be very happy with the result. Um, what I'd like to do is briefly walk you through the plans, and I have some colored versions of what are part of my architectural set that was submitted. Um, so I don't know whether these need to be marked or not. If you're going to refer to them, please. That would be A3, I think we're starting at. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me the date? <laughs> and could you also identify the date of the plans you refer to? Sure. Um, these plans uh, are dated 4 22, 22. And, Sorry, A3? Yes. That's correct. Okay. So what we're looking at is sheet A 01 of my site. Uh, of my architectural plans, and we have, as was described, we have two levels of garages in each of the buildings, A and B, and this is the lower level. We're starting at the bottom, sort of the basement level below grade. You won't see this, um, but we have two, two garage elements. This garage is uh, on building A is accessed by a ramp, which uh, is entered off the left side of the building and comes down to this area, and then uh, in building B, we have a direct access because of the lower grade along that side. We can come right in. So there's no ramp interconnecting the garages in building uh, B. Uh, we have some bike storage located in the lower level of this garage, and you'll see it on the upper level of the A garage. Uh, we have elevators that come to this level to bring uh, people up to their uh, dwelling units directly from the garage. Now we're at the ground floor level, and this shows both buildings. Oh, Mr. Miller, just for the sake of the record, what, can you tell us what page number you're on? I'm now? sorry, this is sheet A02. Of exhibit A3, correct? I'm sorry? Of exhibit A3, correct. correct? Thank you. And what we're seeing here is the ground level, and you see in the gray the upper levels of the, of the garages, but facing uh, Route 1, we have uh, retail in the blue area on the ground floor. And you see our main drop-off here at, at the plaza. This is our main lobby with some amenities, and I'm going to show you a blow-up of this to, to show these spaces in just a minute. And we have some dwelling units located right along our outdoor amenity deck, which has a, a featured pool in that area. And I know our landscape architect is going to talk a great deal about these spaces, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But basically, I know there were some questions about how do deliveries occur? Uh, packages are a big deal um, in residential communities. A lot of uh, Amazon delivery and FedEx and the like. And uh, that, that occurs right in this drop-off area brought to the lobby. And each building has its own separate package storage room. So a package gets delivered to the staff at the building. They place it in the package room. And people get a text message that they have a package. So when they get home from work, or wherever they pick up their package. It's a managed system, and we've learned over the years we have to keep making these bigger and bigger because people are getting more and more packages. Also, we have our mail rooms located with mail kiosks in the upper each building. Um, 
So let me move to the blow up of the uh, amenity spaces. And if you've ever seen a Russo residential building, you'll know that they're a wild space as you come in. We have a feature, I'm, I'm referring to sheet A-02.1, uh, which is a blow up of the ground floor of the residential buildings. We have a, a beautiful uh, feature stairway as you come in, main reception desk. Our leasing area is located conveniently in the uh, lobby space. We have some co-working space, which is a very popular amenity. And especially with post-COVID now, people have learned to work at home, but they also want a place to get out of their apartment and have some special rooms that they can go in. Some of them are video conference rooms that are set up for Zoom meetings, that type of thing. So people really appreciate those spaces as well as conference areas. Uh, we have a lounge here and then a beautiful club room type lobby which will be full of uh, beautiful furniture uh, that will function as a party area leading out to the outdoor amenity space. Uh, I might mention that we do have a service corridor behind the retail for those retail spaces to be serviced along the back side with entries on either side of the building. And then there are private terraces for these residential buildings or units right along the main outdoor amenity area. Next sheet is uh, sheet A-03, which is the second floor plan. And here you see the building become pretty much a residential double loaded corridor building. We have these uh, beautiful wings that jut into these uh, C-shaped courtyards, which uh, people on the upper levels love the views into those courtyards that are uh, passive and landscaped in a very beautiful way. Again, you'll hear more about that. But we continue the amenity spaces up to the second level, and I'm going to show you the next plan is a, is a blow up of those amenity spaces. It's sheet A-3.1. So what we have upstairs is you've come up that main stairway or the elevators on either side. We have a gym space which is up on the second level over the main lobby. This is all glass looking out to the uh, pool deck and we have an outdoor terrace area off of that gym. We have yoga and stretching spaces as well as gym equipment. We have more co-working space here. and. Um, this is a, a private dining area, so many times they, people will have a demonstration chef come in and cook um, meals for people in a private dining setting, and people can reserve that who live in the building. And then we have restrooms located here. Um, and lastly, uh, these are the upper level residential plants, the third and fourth residential levels. Sheet A.04. And again, the only difference here is that the residential units now continue over top of the amenity space in the center. Um, Diego, do, do you have the uh, renderings for me? What I'd like to do now is describe the exterior of the buildings using a few perspective renderings. So I guess we should mark these. I don't think they're part of the submission set. So A4, please. A4. And today's date. Okay. Okay. So we have the entrance to the building. We're looking at our, our main front entry to the, to the building. Here's the uh, drop off, the circular drop off in front. And what you see are, are very exciting residential spaces and this mixed-use environment that we hope is very active. Um, you see that the sidewalk areas are large enough to have cafe dining for restaurant spaces along those retail stores in the front. Our main residential entry coming into the project is right here. And you see the use of, of a variety of materials. We have uh, two types of what are called glass reinforced concrete um, exterior pieces. Those are 
Yeah, I'll give you an example. This area here, right around the main entry, is uh, created out of that material. It's a very high quality, <coughs> lasting material. We have two types of, two colors of metal panel. We have a composite wood panel that you see used here. We have uh, two colors of brick. Um, um, uh, we have a, uh, a lighter colored brick here, and then we have a darker gray manganese brick uh, that we use in certain locations. Here you see some of the reddish brick. Here you see the step back at the upper level creating some private terraces off of those upper units. A great device to, uh, for people to have some additional uh, balcony space on, on those buildings. So the windows are, are high quality uh, windows. They're a gelled wooden residential window and uh, aluminum storefront on the lower level. We use uh, anodized aluminum railings for the balcony railings that you see. So a great palette of uh, contemporary materials. And we think that this style of architecture is attractive to really the two groups that we expect here, younger professionals and older empty nesters. Both are being well-educated in design and they're responding to architecture like this. Let me move to the next. So this is a daytime rendering of the front looking more from Route 1. You're a little bit further away. You see more of the expanse of the building. And you see one of our pad restaurant sites out in front here. And uh, here you see a little bit larger stretch of the building. Mr. And it's, I'm sorry, can you just mark this as A5 for us A5. before you get going? Sorry, right, A5. Please. Thank you. So, one of the things that we really wanted to create from Route 1 is a building that's not boxy apartment buildings. So we have, you can see how the cornice line is, is jumping along the frontage. The materials change, there's shadow line, both horizontally and vertically. Very attractive, uh, tuck-in balconies, and then some hung balconies here. So there's a lot of variety here, but I think it's composed in a way it, it, it makes a great composition for the site. I think that's, that's all we have. Yeah. So this really it, uh, sort of ends my direct testimony if there are any questions that you might have about the architecture. One thing I wanted to answer that were in the review letters was a screening of the mechanical equipment. We have parapets on the roof and our mechanical equipment is actually pretty low. It's basically residential style condensing units, and those are located down the center of the roof over the corridors of the double loaded corridor. So people uh, either driving or pedestrians around the buildings will not see the mechanical equipment just because it's located in the center of the roof and there is some parapet on the roof to, to screen that. So we think that that's, that mechanical equipment is hidden very well. Mr. Minot, I know our engineer test, uh, touched on it, but can you just explain how um, trash and recycling will work in the buildings, please? Sure. Uh, each of the residential floors has a trash trash room with a, with a chute for trash and containers for recycling. And those are brought down or, or come, come down a chute to the uh, trash termination room in the garages, and there's four of them. And building management brings that trash out or the containers for recycling at a very scheduled time on trash pickup day. This is all private hauler, so it's, it's building managed. The trash doesn't sit out there for hours. It's a very tight schedule of when those people come and pick up the trash and recycling. So it works very well. And uh, Russo has really worked on how to keep that uh, going as a system in the residential buildings. Thank you, Mr. Minow. I don't have any further questions for you, but um, we're happy to respond to questions from the board. I have just one. The interior courtyards, are they accessible to residents, or are they more to look at? No, they're accessible. Yeah, in fact, they're used. And I, I'm, I don't want to steal the landscape architect's thunder. He's going to show you some good detail and color uh, and the plant materials that are in there and how they're designed. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to them. And that's really one of the things that make these communities, again, in a post-COVID environment, people like to work outside. So the outdoor courtyards are Wi-Fi uh, compatible. People can go do their work 
on, on nice days out in those courtyards. So, good question. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, next, I'd ask Mr. Seckler to join us. Mr. Seckler to join us. Okay. Can we please have Mr. Seckler sworn? Matthew Seckler. That's S E C K L E R. Yes, I do. Okay, Mr. Seckler, can you please uh, introduce yourself to the board and the public and tell them about your experience and credentials as a traffic engineer? Certainly. I'm a principal at Stonefield Engineering Design. Our address is 92 Park Avenue in Rutherford, New Jersey. Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Union College in Schenectady, New York. A Master's in City Regional Planning from the Blaston School in Rutgers just around the corner. Uh, I've been practicing the field of uh, traffic engineering for over 15 years. I'm a licensed professional engineer and professional planner in the state. Also recognized professional traffic operations engineer by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Thank you. We'd ask that Mr. Seckler be accepted as an expert in traffic engineering, please. Your qualifications are accepted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Seckler, can you please tell us about uh, traffic on site and anticipated ingress and egress? Certainly, I'll enter through this <laughs> door and put up uh, one of the old pictures that we had up here. This was the colorized site plan. This is exhibit A1, A1 for the record. For the record. And the last two witnesses gave a lot of explanation regarding the proposed conditions of the site. And I'll get there with my traffic testimony, but I think what's important is to remember the existing conditions that are on the site, or really the pre-existing conditions when the site was in full operation. The site, to remind everybody, has two curb cuts along Route 1, two right in, right out driveways, and the access, access at the back onto Labor Center Way and Phelps Avenue at that four-way intersection. Um, the site previously was occupied by a Sears. Uh, the buildings itself, including the main building and the auto building, uh, appeared to be constructed back in the 1960s. I don't know if it was Sears that whole way through. Uh, but obviously, when you look at the amount of parking that had on the site, at points when it was busy, I imagine that Sears generated a significant amount of traffic. One aspect about retail-type traffic is that it tends to have continuous turnover. So people may be, you know, you may have cars coming to the site you know, on a Saturday from 10 in the morning all the way to 5 p.m., 6 p.m. at night, just continually turning over the parking spaces. When I talk about our traffic state, it's important to remember that aspect of it, although the Sears obviously has not been busy for quite a while. It's now not open at all or fenced up. Uh, but you know, it's important to remember that this site was designed to accommodate large levels of traffic being generated utilizing the two site driveways on Route 1 and the one access driveway out the rear of the site. In terms of our traffic study, we prepared a traffic study and prepared to the and sent it and submitted it to the board. Included within that was traffic counts that we conducted back in February. Included counts that were conducted during your morning and evening rush hour time periods, as well as your Saturday time period in the middle of the day, which is your typical kind of um, like retail peak period where people are running their errands throughout the day. It's important to note that even though we're in this kind of COVID post-COVID world. We checked back at counts that were done along Riders Lane prior to COVID, back in, I think, 2018, the DOT did. And our counts at the intersection of um, Labor Center Way and Riders Lane basically match up to those counts. So February seems to be indicative of what is now a standard, typical traffic patterns uh, for this general community and area. And we made sure we did the counts while uh, Rutgers was in session. We actually started this project well before February. Missed out on winter break. There was some COVID outbreaks here or there. Made sure Rutgers was in full session when we did our counts uh, in February. So we performed our counts, and then what we did is we looked at what the level of traffic that we generated from this proposed development. And we have a mix of uses on the site. We have two existing uses that will stay, the two restaurants along Route 1. Uh, we are adding the uh, proposed drive-through fast food restaurant user up at near Route 1. Uh, the retail building that may be a grocer that was building C. The mixed-use buildings A and B and the townhouses in the rear, and we're basically uh, utilizing the Institute of Transportation Engineers, which is the definitive source for projecting traffic, determine what the overall traffic would be generated from this site. It's important to note that, that is actually less than what a typical Sears uh, when it was busy, or your typical about 100,000 square foot retail establishment. You think of what would be built on that type of model, you know, if a uh, Target or Walmart or something like that of that kind of ilk, because that's what you know, Sears was of its time, would generate significantly more traffic than the traffic that we are proposing to generate from this site. So we're actually bringing the traffic down from what could reoccupy the building, or what may have been uh, popular in the 80s and 90s in this Sears site. 
Um, also to notice the type of traffic is, is a little different. Again, retail tends to kind of turn over significantly. This is obviously a mix of uses. So we do have the residential, which really generally sees people leaving in the morning, returning at night. You know, maybe you run some errand uh, throughout the day, but a lot less turnover than you would see with just a pure retail establishment. So also important to note that this style design, mixed use design, much like you see in the downtown portions of, of New Brunswick, it's uh, designed to help reduce the amount of trips on the outward roadways by providing retail establishments, restaurants, grocers, some sort of uh, food restaurants along with the two existing food restaurants. It helps keep some of the traffic on the site itself. People who live upstairs, they need to go get some food. Maybe they go to the restaurant downstairs. Maybe some of these retail establishments is a nail salon. So someone goes there instead of getting in their car and driving elsewhere. Uh, same thing with the grocer, and obviously we know the proliferation of delivery services and things like that, you know, helping create uh, a community here that doesn't necessarily require the use of an automobile. In addition, the, uh, the applicant does provide on all their sites shuttle service to mass transportation. Uh, they operate, and, uh, uh, operate themselves. It's basically used. Uh, the more people that use it, the more service they provide. So if they need to get two vans because the first van's filling up, they provide a second van. So the shuttle service would likely run between here and the train station. It may also, depending on the usage, run between here and perhaps maybe Tower Center for the bus service in that area. So again, this is a site that, while it is not, I would say, as, um, as, as well located in terms of mass transit compared to many other places within the city, uh, by having this connection, that uh, last mile connection it's called basically, to provide that shuttle helps keep, keep one individual cars off the road, it helps maintain a little bit lower levels of car ownership. That said, our parking supply is sufficient, it meets the ordinance standards, uh, so we do have sufficient parking that includes the resident only parking, the retail only parking fields, and then that mix kind of shared areas where some overflow residential, some guest residential, and the overflow retail would all uh, intermingle on some of those outer uh, 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 lots on the site. So overall, from a traffic perspective, we are actually seeing a decrease in the amount of traffic compared to what a typical thriving operating uh, retail building that is on the site today would, would generate. We think the type of uses is well designed to help keep some of those uh, travel trips on site so people be kind of walking to and from the various uses on the site. And we are utilizing the existing driveways and curb cuts that have existed for uh, it looks like you know, 40, 50 years on these highways and connections, uh, which obviously have been able to support this development uh, over the last few decades. So overall, from a traffic engineering perspective, we move the site to design efficiently and effectively in terms of off-site. On-site, you heard the design standards. This is uh, designed to meet, I would say, the latest demands. Drop-off pickup areas for your Ubers or Lyfts. Lots of delivery or loading areas for your Uber, Eats, DoorDash. Uh, Amazon deliveries, uh, all that is basically provided on site. So this is you know, the latest and greatest in what people are looking for with their multifamily buildings, uh, as opposed to having to retrofit older buildings. Uh, this site's uh, been designed with that in mind. Thank you, Mr. Seckler. I don't have further questions for you, but um, if the board has any, we're happy to respond. Uh, I, I think that the, the, I know that there was a, uh, recommendation associated with the redevelopment plan for some kind of a public uh, transportation element. I think that was addressed here in the shuttle service that you yes. that you provided. Yes. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure, and if I didn't, I should have. In terms of the landscaping, you are you the right person to talk talk about? Uh, probably not, but I think someone else. He, he's coming next. <laughs> oh, okay. Then now I forget that. Yes. Okay. All right. Without further ado, we'll do landscaping. Mr. <laughs> Tronco. Okay. We would ask that Mr. Tronco please be sworn. Jason Tronco, T R O N C O. Melillo and Bauer. I do. Okay, Mr. Tronco, please introduce yourself to the board and the public and tell them about your experience and credentials. I'm a landscape architect at Melillo, Bauer, and Carmen uh, for the last 24 years. I have a bachelor in landscape architecture from West Virginia University. I uh, testified in numerous boards in New Jersey. I've uh, been qualified as an expert in landscape architecture. 
Uh, um, I'm a prof professional planner by exam. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> You'd ask that he'd be accepted as a landscape architect, please. Exactly. Thank you. All right, Mr. Tronka, why don't you tell us about the landscaping that's being proposed as well as the sure. deviations that the applicant requires. Okay. Um, in regard to the waivers, they're mostly landscape architecture in, in nature. Uh, Kate did a fabulous job of explaining <laughs> them. Um, she really did. She, you know, gave the reasons, uh, most of the reasons why we are requesting these waivers. Um, the first one in regard to street trees. Um, she mentioned we have 300 trees associated with the streets on this project. Um, most every single street, drive aisle, um, parking area is lined with street trees. And we do that because we like to create uh, tree-lined streets within the uh, development. Um, there's slight deviations. Uh, if I could use the Exhibit A1. <clears throat> uh, in this area along the eastern property line, there's an existing buffer to the residential properties. Uh, also in that area is a retaining wall that's proposed fairly close to the curb line. Um, so there's a few areas next to the parallel parking spaces that we won't have the uh, we won't have the shade trees. In that area, we are proposing shrubs and evergreen trees to supplement that buffer. Uh, one of the other areas is at the back of the multifamily. Um, as you can see here, there's 10, 12, 15 trees across there, but there's a couple areas that exceed 70 feet spacing. Uh, and that's due to the pull-offs and parallel, uh, parallel parking spaces along that run. And that's only on the south side of that uh, thoroughfare there in the street. Um, the other area, <coughs> if I can remember what it was, the Oh, it's internal to the alleys within, the, so the townhomes have rear loaded uh, garages and there's, we consider them alleys. And between driveways, it, it's a fairly narrow area. It's about three and a half feet between the uh, driveways. So it's just not appropriate to put trees in those areas um, for snow plowing and, and, and everything. Uh, but we really don't consider that a street that's more of an access way for the, for the back of the townhomes. Um, in regard to Foundation landscaping, this is a requirement where uh, all the buildings should have landscaping around the periphery. Um, that happens on all the buildings throughout the development, with the exception of the front of what potentially can be the food store that's paved with decorative pavers that's good for access and carts and, and all the same. At the rear of that building, which would be the north side, um, there's service oriented activities happening there. Uh, you know, drop off with materials and trash and everything, so that's also not landscaped with foundation material. Um, one other area where that occurs is at G, which would be the pad site. Again, we develop that with outdoor seating, decorative pavement, access to the building and such. So on the north and east side of that building, um, there, there's not proposed foundation planting. <clears throat> Parking lot landscaping is the next waiver. Um, your ordinance requires 10% uh, gross parking area to be landscaped. As you can see, the periphery of all the parking areas are landscaped, with the exception of, of the existing condition along the western property. Um, we have street trees within those parking lot islands. The perimeters uh, are planted with shrubs, ground cover, ornamental trees, uh, shade trees to provide that screening. Uh, so that's just a slight deviation in, in regard to the number, uh, the percentage number of landscaped areas within the parking lots. Um, Kate went through the uh, percentages. <clears throat> parking lot to a property line um, was a was a, was the existing condition. Uh, parking lot to the right of way buffer that occurs in this small area adjacent to Phelps. Um, we did we didn't. Uh, put the periphery of those parallel parking spaces with, with a hedge. We could totally do that. We thought um, wide open lawns, a wide open lawn area with the shade trees was just a better design for that area. It's more in keeping with the, um, the continuity of the streetscape that we create. Um, we didn't consider it a parking lot. 
<clears throat> and that pretty much kind of pops through the waivers that we are um, requesting. Um, I would like to mention that the buffer to Clifton Avenue has been enhanced. So, um, uh, Sean mentioned, you know, going through, Kate mentioned, we were going through there and clearing a lot of the dead and damaged trees, but in addition to that, we're putting in um, a good amount of plant material. Um, if I can recall off, offhand, it was, you know, 30 shade trees and, and 55 um, evergreen trees, along with like 140 shrubs, so we're really bulking up that, that buffer there. Um, as Dave mentioned, we have a lot of exciting amenities, you know, throughout the development. You know, the, the, the courtyard has a pool for the multifamily building, uh, passive recreation, places to gather, uh, shade structures, uh, dining areas. Uh, up on the second floor of both building A and B, we also have passive recreation. It, it has some of the same uses, dining areas, gathering areas. Um, fire pits and the same. Uh, adjacent to the townhomes, we, we have the ch you know, child play area, which was a nice feature. Um, you know, to have the neighbors have a place for their children to play. Also a central seating area that's located in the open space. And a dog, as Sean has mentioned, we have a dog run adjacent to Phelps. Pretty good size. Small, uh, it'll accommodate small dogs, large dogs. Uh, and it's just a great, great feature for the uh, community. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Tronco. I don't have further questions for you, but if any board have questions, we're happy to respond. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, you go. I think we're going to ask the same questions. You go. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, uh, I'm pretty sure that in the kind of the discussion or review of the, the um, redevelopment plan, which I think was meeting called January, but I kind of stressed that the, um, uh, uh, it related to the composition of the vegetation. Oh, sure. That, you know, we, you know, although there's no legal requirement for this, that, you know, uh, um, should encourage the use of native vegetation to the greatest extent practicable. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, definitely. Right. I should have started with that. Um, so, you know, Kate mentioned we have a comprehensive landscape plan here. It's, it's really robust in the planting. Uh, we use native adaptive plant material, uh, plant material that's going to provide um, habitat, yeah, pollinator species. Um, so the, the most, all of the plant list is native material, native to the local area of New Jersey. Should have hit on that. Should have. Sorry. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Those are all of our witnesses, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's proceed to um, <coughs> opening this up for uh, to the public. Again, just stressing that yes. Okay, yes. Right. number of folks. Right. So, just stressing that this is good. Right. these are comments relevant to this particular application moment as it as this part of the portion of the board. Okay, who do we got? All right, so if anyone is interested in addressing the board on this application, um, please, uh, I guess, raise your hand, then I'll add you to the list. I'd like to be an objector, please. All right, let's, let's, just, let's just jot you down for a second, Mr. Cardinal, and then I'll go through everybody and then we can come back to that. That's all right. Um, Danielle Moore. Yes. Tony Elridge. Tony Elridge. E L D R I D G. Okay. Uh, Anyone else? Amber Sadavia. Uh, S A R A V I A. S A R A V I A. Patricia Baumler. Stella? Stella? B-O-R-O-L. B-A-L-L. Hi. Wait, wait, Name? wait a second. Name, please? No, no, wait a second. I'm getting her. Stella. B-O-M-B-E-L-Y-F. Thank you. Thank you. Name, please, sir. Sorry. Your name? 
Jaycica, S-I-C-A. Yeah, so similar to the last application, I did want to put some objections on the record, but I also want to have the letter that I submitted be a part of this record and clarify that uh, under your rules, I have a right to be an objector which allows me to present a case, including calling witnesses and presenting evidence. And we have quite a number of people here who are going to present. You know, uh, I want to take that into consideration. I, I hope you're not going to be, once again, addressing the qualifications of the people on the board. I just don't think it's appropriate question to ask at a meeting at this kind of venue. You know? Fair enough, no questions, but for the record, I do want to you know, lodge my objections and respectfully, you know, no disrespect to anyone here, just state my, my objections. Sure. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll proceed with that. So uh, I do object to class four members who hold other offices with the municipality participating today. Also object to Ms. Sakura Ludwig participating since she's already uh, declared her position in favor of the applicant. Um, I did you know, submit that letter and wanted to be very clear that I want to be an objector and be able to call one witness and present one, two, three, four uh, documents into evidence. And uh, I can be as brief as, 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 as I can, but these, if there's a five minute time limit, it's going to be. Are these witnesses that are, are scheduled or who raise their hand and are going to? None of none of those folks. The only witness I'd like to call is Mr. Dominguez. Well, that's pretty regular. Um, I'll note in the letter I presented I that have, I haven't seen the letter, but it's basically your letter is stating that you you you're, you're kind of registering as an objector. Is that correct? And, and I did ask Mr. Dominguez for a document. He prepared a memo with regard to this site, this development. It came up at the Housing Authority last week. I asked for a copy of it so that I could review it before tonight, and I didn't get a copy of it. So that's one reason I'd like to be able to, to ask him questions. And I think it's, you know, you know, under your rules, it's acceptable for me to call him as a witness. He's here. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, so it's, it's one thing for a, um, a member of the public or an objector to, to call their own witnesses. The concern about um, a member of the public asking uh, a, the board's professional staff to serve as a witness is that actually does have a risk of um, if, it, if it's a if it's just an inquiry that's fine but if he's asking the the member of the staff to provide testimony in support of his objection that would potentially create a conflict um, because then they're being asked to wear two hats one serving the board and one serving an objector so it, it depends on the nature of the inquiry that mr. Cradiville if he's expecting mr. Dominguez to, to testify um, it, it, an objection to the to the application that would be a concern if he's asking a a question seeking general information. I, I suppose I don't have an objection to it. Mr. Chairman, if I could, as before, can we just get to the point? What is yeah. the nature sure. of your <laughs> objection? Certainly, uh, happy to do that. So the questions for Mr. Dominguez would be with regard to that memo and uh, you know why it wasn't provided, what it contains, and also this statement that I found on the city website. Uh, July 8th, the uh, Housing Authority selects redeveloper for Sears site. So those would be the two items that I'd want to ask him about, and that's all. Those are uh, established facts. They have, been, they have been named as the redeveloper. You don't have to introduce any evidence to that point. We know they're the named redeveloper. If you've asked for a document from us under an Oprah and you haven't gotten it yet, okay, that's an acceptable fact. But that, what has that got to do? How is that relevant to this application? Sorry, how is that relevant to your objection to this application? So uh, the planning department prepared a memo with respect to this site, and I asked for it not under Oprah, but under this proceeding in, in an email that, that I've now provided to, to the board, and I, I, I didn't get it, so I didn't get any response, as a matter of fact, and I wanted to learn more about what is in that memo. And also, I don't, I, I'm not disputing that the Housing Authority did designate the redeveloper, but I had some questions about this comment, these comments so, in the... As before, how is that so, I beg your pardon. How is that relevant to your objection to this application? I gotta ask. My it's an informing application, they've asked for some um, waivers. 
what do you have to say to, or to object to the criteria that the board would consider in determining whether this application should be approved or not? Yes, so, so my questions go to the, the designation of redeveloper under the redevelopment plan and the process that led to that happening. And this board didn't do that. Right, but the redevelopment plan you did do. The designation of them as redeveloper was done by the city council, and the adoption of the redevelopment plan was done by the city council. I know. This just talks about 2018, and so I wanted to ask questions about the timeline. Mr. Solomon, so. just for FYI, um, the redevelopment authority, uh, uh, sorry, um, the Brunswick Housing Authority was the redeveloper designation uh, entity, not the city council. Just right. FYI. The point being, it wasn't this board. So go ask that board why they did what they did. I don't know why you're asking this board and what it has to do with the nature of this application. Sure. I, I, I wanted to ask about the proposals that were received and the, what led to the redevelopment plan being crafted the way it was crafted, uh, specifically without a requirement for on-site affordable housing, which is my big beef uh, with, with the, the application. I'm sure th those are perfectly reasonable questions of the appropriate board, not this board, because it doesn't have anything to do with the jurisdiction of this board and the criteria that this board would use in determining whether the application should be approved or not. This board has, for example, you mentioned affordable housing. This board has no control over affordable housing in the city. <coughs> well, you, you did produce and uh, sign off on the, the redevelopment plan, which is what I was going to get to with my questions. Uh, uh, respectfully, the, the plan has already been adopted by the city council and is not the question before the board this evening. Okay, well. Perhaps I'll find another time to ask Mr. Dominguez questions if the board doesn't see fit for, for that you to take place. I received a response to your request. It's unfortunate. I did yeah. specify I wanted it for tonight so that I could have at least 24 hours to review it and potentially introduce it, potentially you know have more information. I don't know what's in the memo, so it's unfortunate. But um, I'll proceed without that, and it sounds like you're denying my request to call Mr. Dominguez as a witness. Yeah, I don't think that's a great idea. Okay. Fair enough. I will, um, I, I do want to clarify whether I'm going to be time limited or not. Yes, I believe you will. Be. Okay, and what is the time limit since you said it, Mr. Chair? Five minutes. Okay, so just want to be clear, I'm not objecting, I'm not being allowed to object under Section D, which, which has no time limit. I'm being told that I have to fit all my comments and questions into five minutes under Section F. Mr. Cradley, you don't have any witnesses, though, this evening, correct? But I, but I do have evidence to, to introduce, and I would like to question some of your witnesses about sure. these, these things, so. And do so. Okay, but I just want to be clear, it's not happening under Section D with no time limits happening under Section F, which is for interested parties to give public commentary. There's a difference, and there, there's an order of operations. The reason I stood up first is not because I think I'm the most important person here. It's because I want to uh, follow the rules, and the, the objectors go first, and they get to make a case. And then it's opened up to interested parties to give public commentary. And, and frankly, I, I would like to do both, but it sounds like you're going to make me, make me only do the latter and not, not allow the first. Is that? Yes, that's my preference. I would certainly appreciate your comments and questions. And questions to others to a five-minute time period like everyone else. Okay. Well, uh, uh, for the record, I think that's the wrong decision. I will proceed. Um, I have three documents to introduce. I'll just actually uh, give you them all at once to save time. So these are documents from the applicant's application for a long-term tax exemption. It is the uh, apartment rent assumptions, the 30-year pilot projections, and the comparable apartments study. Um, before I get there, I do have some questions for the witnesses. Um, Mr. Savage said 198 townhomes. I had thought it was going to be 190 townhomes. Can he clarify the number? I had said 190. 190, okay. Um, do you want to clarify? He said, quote, sort of planned to be a grocery. Um, it's fair to say there's no tenant lined up and no guarantee that there will be a grocer operating there. Uh, 
the, the building's designed to be suitable to a grocer, but there is not a grocer um, that's committed to the building as of yet. Okay. Um, with regard to the private roads, uh, you touched on this, Mr. Chair. Why can't the roads be public? I know there's some HOAs in New Brunswick where there's real problems with keeping the roads up. Um, So will it be their sole responsibility or will it be an HOA responsible for the roads? Based on my understanding, it would be the responsibility of the developer. If I may, Mr. Chairman, the developer will be responsible for the majority of the roads. The roads that are internal to the townhome development will be the homeowner association's responsibility, but of course the developer will maintain ownership of the remainder of the property in it, and there's an easement agreement that governs how those roads will be maintained as between the two of them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Seckler mentioned the shuttle service. Uh, is there a set place where people would get picked up or dropped off? Is there going to be a shelter? I didn't see one in the, the plans. I don't believe there is one established yet. However, I imagine they would use the drop-off pickup area loop uh, that's basically between building A and building B. Okay. Uh, I have some more questions on that topic. Uh, how many hours a day or days a week might the, the shuttle service run? Is this something that would only be for rush hour commuters in the mornings and the you know, uh, uh, early evenings? Or is this something that would be consistent uh, throughout the day? Typically, they begin them with the rush hour commute hours. So, you know, typically three or four hours in the morning, three or four hours in the evening. However, they, they do uh, adjust them based on tenant demand. If they get requests to run different routes or different time periods, they uh, have done that at other locations. Okay. And there's no guarantee where it will go. I heard the train station and potentially Tower Center in East Brunswick. Are there, uh, is there any guarantee there'll be connectivity to the Rutgers campus, to downtown New Brunswick or to other neighborhoods? So again, it's based on tenant demand. So if we find that enough, you know, tenants are asking for a route to the Rutgers campus or elsewhere within the city, then that would be provided. And who can use it? Is, uh, is this only for tenants who, who live in the buildings or the townhomes? Or could I write it if I want to go to the future grocery store um, and back? It's a tenant amenity. So this will not be open to the public. So this is not public transit. Correct. Okay. Well, um, I do want to draw your attention to the exhibits I, I gave you. Um, cheapest unit in this place, we're talking $1,690 average rent for a studio apartment. This is wholly out of step with uh, what people in New Brunswick can afford. Specifically, if you look at the comparable apartments study, uh, Tove Manor is the closest apartment, and you look at their uh, prices. A one-bedroom goes for twelve sixteen. Um, less expensive than a studio. This is really uh, jacking up the prices for people, and I don't think that this will do uh, much good for the people of New Brunswick. It might do good for people from outside New Brunswick. We need affordable housing and a site like this of such a large magnitude, a 36 acre site, is a huge missed opportunity to actually address the housing crisis. Instead, this applicant is doing the opposite and uh, you know, exploiting the site for the maximum possible revenue and not even providing a simple thing like public transportation. Uh, I think that this is going to be an exclusive enclave that will exclude people, uh, the people of New Brunswick from it, and it will actually um, further stratification, segregation, and gentrification in our city, and it should be rejected. Thank you. Uh, just with regard to the affordable housing thing, my limited understanding of this is that there can be no, we can't, the, the city of New Brunswick is essentially exempt from our, this requirement. Um, you know, uh, it, uh, it can't demand that it be part of, the, of uh, these projects. Uh, 
and uh, I also understand that there is some contribution that is uh, going to be made uh, that uh, could be used for the that is to be used for these purposes. I don't know the extent of it and that sort of thing, but perhaps you want to just sure. talk. Certainly, Mr. Chairman. So, firstly, you are correct. The redevelopment plan does not provide for affordable housing to be included on site as part of this development, and of course, the redeveloper intends to adhere to the redevelopment plan that the city council approved. However, the redeveloper um, has agreed to provide a contribution to the, afford the housing authority um, to be put into a fund that can be uh, used to implement affordable housing within the city, and that is a um, term of the uh, financial agreement between the redeveloper and the city, which has now been adopted by ordinance and signed by the city and the redeveloper, and that requires a payment of um, north of a million dollars, it's a million eighty thousand um, dollars that the redeveloper will be making. And then that will be implemented towards, um, but really however the city and the housing authority determine is appropriate to best serve the city's affordable housing objectives. I'll just note that's less than one month's rent. You know, 1500 per unit is the number they're doing. They're charging more than that the first month. I'd also like to just enter into the record the, your rules, two pages of your rules. Um, that unfortunately were not followed tonight. So, uh, this is the attorney. I have a copy. <laughs> okay. All right, next up would be Patricia Bombalin. I don't mind if I go no, last. It's, it's just that Charlie continued on for where he was, but typically we do it in alphabetical order, so that would that be. That wasn't the way you took the names. Come on. I, I, I take no objection if you follow the order you took the names. Doesn't matter. Do you have any objection to just following the order of name taking? I know. No. Ms. Moore, go ahead. Proceed. Not no disrespect to you, no, no, but like no, I, I said, no please. Uh, like I said, no disrespect to you, no, but like I said, I can't not. sit down too long due to where I uh, missed no. my time already. No disrespect, respect to you. I just can't sit not down for a long time. Yes, yeah, Dan Danielle Moore. First, my first question is, please, if you can tell me. Okay, you said 1690 starting. Is there going to be a maintenance fee? for each resident that stays in a unit? So the, well, to, to my knowledge, the rental apartments will not have a maintenance fee. They just pay their rent. Um, and then with regard to the townhomes, those are for sale units. And as part of um, being a member of the homeowners association, they will have monthly maintenance fees. So basically, due to where, and I, one thing that I'm concerned about, due to where I say you shall not vote until you really get the full district, uh, the, the, the layout of what the situation is with the water and the sewer, just like every uh, townhouse, the Renaissance, and the other ones on corner of George Street and Paul Robeson Boulevard, due to where they're all required to maintenance what water main break sewage, the city is not responsible in doing, and like I said, until you get that in writing, due to where I say you don't need to vote on this. Then one thing, if you can also tell me, is well, how many people are allowed in a unit? How, how many people are allowed to stay in a unit? Without killing my time, if you just give me a simple <laughs> number, please. Thank you. I, I can't give you a simple number, but I can tell you that the state has um, statutes that govern the number of uh, occup permitted occupancy. Well, I surely hope so, due to where New Brunswick is already overpopulated already, being live from the city council and the mayor, President Ludwig saying, wow, there's only close to, what, 55,000 residents in New Brunswick? That is a lie. Like I said, I've been here 45 years. I walk, I get around New Brunswick, and I see much more than you do when driving. And to see 620 kids graduate from New Brunswick High School just out of 12th grade alone, please, that is certainly a lie. And like I said, wow, you're saying what even what two people in each unit. New Brunswick is already overpopulated. Like I said, I know quite a few of you, I'm not going to say here, are being paid under the table. Oh, I can see things. I have special vision, which I prove to the city as well. Due to a while to go to housing authority first. They vote no. Then city council to vote. Oh, yes, all oh, yes. Then go back to the housing authority. Then you vote no again. And then while wow, we're back here with your vote. 
And then well, with them then also voting yes again, come on, somebody's being paid. But like I said, the Lord is watching you where money's not going to save you in every way with you keep doing the wrong thing. Come on, for as many votes to go through with this, please. And like I said, mainly for all the ones on the housing authority to vote no and then change their answer to yes, wow, that's already showing, like I said, and like, like, like I said at the meeting, wow, quite a few are being paid to do this. And like I said, money's not everything. And like I said, New Brunswick needs much more affordable housing due to where you have extremely too much homelessness going on in New Brunswick, people sleeping on the sidewalks down to the river. Come on. Like I said, do, I don't even think any of you really care about New Brunswick. All you really do is care about your pockets, the money going in your pocket and never doing the right thing or investigating anything before something's being done. Because like I said, come on. It is overpopulated, what, with traffic as well, due to a, what, motor, motor vehicle crash, someone's getting hit every day in New Brunswick? Why, because the police department doesn't do their jobs? Too much crime? Come on, enough, enough, we don't need any more un units in, in New Brunswick. Now, what, what, c come on, please, and I, I, like I said, even though I know you guys are going to all, all we just vote yes, none of, like I said, none of you really investigate anything goes on. Same thing with city council. But what, I have to say half the stuff that goes wrong is what? With the city council voting yes because they don't investigate things before they do something. And like I said, until you get the writing and what with the situation with the water and the sewage, which is a main concern with New Brunswick, with, the, with backing up, please, I hope you, even though, like I said, no need to even ask you, because like I said, I already know what your answer is going to be with all, all of you. Like I said, I do have psychic vision. But like I said, come on, stop thinking about money. Do the right thing for New Brunswick residents. Stop thinking about money. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Good night. Good job. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Good job. Uh, next up is, uh, and I, I botched this up, but Tony. Tony. Okay. Um, name is Tony Elridge. E L D R I D G E. Okay. Uh, yes, I do. Um, Thank you guys for allowing us to speak. I appreciate that. Um, I live on the corner of Clifton and Cotter, okay, which is right behind the location where this development will take place. Specifically, I am right behind where the old auto center is. Okay. Yes, as I was saying, I live on the corner of Cotter and Clifton Avenue, okay? And um, I want to say that I'm not totally opposed to this development, okay? I would like to see improvements in New Brunswick. However, I think that the improvements should come with some value-added initiatives for the community. Okay, and what I am very startled about is the fact that I don't see, you know, what I expected to see, which would be true diligence by the people in front of me in doing their homework to make sure that real value added is brought along with this development. Okay, um, as was stated clearly here. Okay, that the infrastructure, in particular to the electric grid, the water and the sewer, okay, will not be improved beyond where we personally have it. Okay, I've called the city and the mayor's office several times over the last three or four years about one particular problem, okay, and that's the sewer line that runs from Sears over in front of my house that stinks up the place, okay? And all they have given me is lip service that they would come, clean it out every month, and throw some cherry bombs to get rid of the odor. And what I've heard tonight is the very same thing, okay? That 
the developer will bestow on us the ability to get some cameras in and check the lines. Totally unacceptable. I live there, my family is there, I have three kids, okay? One of the basic things about any development, okay, is what they bring to the community. In particular, the infrastructure, an improvement on the infrastructure, okay? There's no reason why the existing sewer line that comes from Sears should be used by the 270 plus units that's being additionally added there. That should be closed off, and more importantly, they should, New Brunswick that is, should improve the sewer line in that area. They're not doing that. They're not going to add more to that line. Okay? Totally, totally unacceptable. Okay? And secondly, where the grocery is going to be built, okay? Um, it's in the northeastern portion of that development, which is where the auto center presently is. Okay? Would you say auto center, Sears Auto Center. Now it's nice that, you know, we're getting some amenities like, you know, some trees being planted, you know, some grass being, you know, laid, you know. But the real infrastructure for which I'm referring to is, you know, what's being done with the sewer and what's being done with the health of the environment, that community, okay? There should be a retaining wall right before the gorge on the other side of that fence preventing any type of rats, rodents, or whatever it is that's going to be stacked where those dumpsters were clearly defined to be, okay? I don't know if anyone here has any skin in the game, but I'm going to be living there. My family's going to be living there, okay? And I think one of the basic things this community should have done, okay, and it doesn't seem like I'm going to start by the fact that you stated that you know, all they're going to do is put a camera in and look into those pipes. You know, that's unacceptable. You know, I need, a, I need a retaining wall and I need that sewer line that's coming over to be shut off. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Mr. Tom Kelso. <coughs> <coughs> Thomas F. Kelso, K-E-L-S-O. You swear or affirm to hold the truth? Sure, I do. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, obviously familiar with the procedure here, but I'm here not as a lawyer. I'm here as a resident. I live at 15 Clifton Avenue which is the third house in from Route 18, right where the buffer area. I've been a resident there for 40 years. Raised my kids there, now my grandkids are running all over the place there. Uh, and I want to make it clear, I do not represent Russo Development. I've never represented them. The only time I've ever really had contact with them was when I learned about this project. But I have had an opportunity to, to meet on site on a, on a few occasions with their representatives, the landscape architect, their, their uh, site people. Mr. Russo himself came, came out and walked with me. And, one, and the thing that, that I've had a concern about, but I want to make clear, I support this project. I think this is a great project. I think it's great for the city. Obviously, there's a lot of unknown that gives residents fear. And that's understandable. I've been, as a land use attorney, I've been in that situation many times. And I know there's a fear of the unknown. But my reaction to my interaction with Russo is, I think they're straight. Uh, they have spent a lot of time with me, with others in the neighborhood where we have walked that buffer area, not only Clifton Avenue, but along Cotter Drive. And it is in really in very bad condition. And having been there for 40 years, I've seen it go through in a, a transformation, because early on, Sears was a good neighbor, and Sears maintained that buffer. And, it, and it's a huge buffer, if you've ever been out there. I mean, it, it's, it's not only wide, it's not only long, but the mature trees, they're 60, 70, 80 feet high. But they're at the end of their useful life. 
and a number of them, particularly over the last few years, have, have fallen, have died, and there is a great need to enhance that buffer. This is a perfect opportunity for us as the neighbors who live along there to get that done. And I, want to, I really want to give Russo's people credit for having spent the time with me and, and with a few others walking that site and getting our ideas of what should happen there. And we, and we gave them many ideas, uh, certain things because where their detention basin is that's going to be there, that's not there today, that's just a field. But that's the trade-off that you have here. They're, they are making significant improvements in that buffer along Clifton and, and along Cotter. They're going to be regrading. And I don't think it was stated strongly enough that the number of plantings that they're going to put there are enormous. I mean, there, there is a, and, and they've got a different concept where it's going to not be one straight line of those trees, but there's going to be pockets of where you're going to have really, really nice, uh, different look, uh, but still will maintain it, the buffer kind of appearance. But they've also taken input from me, particularly with regard to putting shrubbery in that's not going to get eaten in the first week by the deer colony that we have. Uh, and I think it's important that they recognize that. Landscape architect came back with a plan, had made those changes. So I'm confident in, in, in trusting Russo development to do the right thing here. Knowing of their reputation uh, outside of, uh, of the city of New Brunswick helps, but having had the interaction that I've had with them, I have a lot of trust that, that what they're going to be doing for us as neighbors uh, in Dewey Heights is really going to be a major improvement for all of us. Uh, I think that, um, I, I particularly don't think traffic issue is an issue for us where the ingress and egress is for this site. Really doesn't impact Dewey Heights at all. Uh, but, uh, but I think that overall, again, I wanted to say I do support the plan. Uh, I think it's, it's one that's really going to have a, uh, a real positive uh, impact for the city of New Brunswick. And I want to emphasize again, to credit them for making that million dollar contribution to affordable housing that the city can determine where best that money is going to be utilized. And they've creating that fund that other developers will ultimately be contributing into as well. So I applaud them for the project. I think it's great. And I really appreciate the work that they've done with us neighbors who are most concerned about that buffer area. Up is uh, I hope I got the first name right. Uh, Amber Saravia. Uh, please say your name, your last name. Mm -hmm. for the My name is Amber Saravia. Last name S A R A. B's and Victor I A. Uh, just to go off the last. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Just to go off the last point, a million dollar payment for affordable housing if split up between 30 years is only about $33,000, which is not much. Um, so definitely got to keep that in consideration. Realize that it really isn't much money for such a large city and such a growing city. Um, I would like to point out some uh, census data points. Um, there's about 36% of people here in New Brunswick who are in poverty. It definitely is a huge issue within the city. We got to keep that in mind when we are thinking about development. Um, although the plan, you know, seems nice, you know, there are a lot of amenities for the people who would be living within these different apartments and townhomes. Um, even myself, I'm like, oh wait, maybe I want to <laughs> live here. But the price, it's it's just too much. It's 1,700 about for a studio, um, and uh, it just it, it's outrageous. The medium household income from 2016 to 2020, it's about $43,000. And so that means that a household at this income can afford to spend up to about $1,000 a month. Um, so we really need to make sure that we're keeping that in mind um, when we're thinking about you know, how much we are charging for rent um, with these new developments within the city. Um, another point I would like to make is that the medium age of someone in New Brunswick is 23 and a half years old. I'm actually that age. <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, went to Rutgers and uh, I would like to stay here. I like the community, I like the people here. Um, but it's, it's getting harder and harder with the rising rent prices. I've been talking to my friends, community about you know, the rent prices and it's, it's challenging. You know, we want to stay here, we want to be part of the community, uh, but the opportunities are becoming less and less and 
uh, with projects like these, uh, we're just you know pursuing gentrification further, um, and we want to make sure that we're taking care of the community and we are representing the city of New Brunswick because it is a truly beautiful place. Um, and I, I'll leave it at that. I hope you guys take my thoughts into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Patricia Bombalin. For real this time. My neighbor, Mr. Sika, has asked to go in front of me, if you'll allow that. Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Can't understand anybody. You guys don't know how to project your voices. Okay, we, we need your name for My name is Jimmy Sika, S I C A. Do you swear or refer to tell the whole truth? I swear to tell everything. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. And that camera should be off. I belong to the Screen Actors Guild. If that camera is on, I get paid. <laughs> and that's fact. <laughs> I've, I am the longest living resident in Dewey Heights. I've been there for 63 years. Dewey Heights. My backyard was a cornfield. I live on the corner of Cotter Drive and Clifton Avenue. My backyard was a cornfield. I used to go out in the morning and steal the corn so I could eat it at night. It was Clifton Avenue was cornfield. Both sides of the road, cornfield. Uh, now it became Sears. Now, when Sears came in there, how many years ago, there was some uh, some deal that was made that Sears could oh, be the only place that is there. The only place that could be on that property is Sears. Now that's all changed. That's all changed. Now, like uh, the gentleman said down before, he said the berm, that berm is in such terrible shape. And like I said, I'm the longest uh, resident in Dewey Heights, so I know, and I own several properties in Dewey Heights. And it's, it's absolutely horrendous. Horrendous, the burn. There's mosquitoes all over, there's everything. So if that's an indication of what this organization is gonna do, uh, it's no way, Jose. <laughs> No way, that, 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 that can't happen. That can't happen. It, it's, it's, it's terrible. And is there gonna be any, there's one entrance and one uh, exit out of Dewey Heights. Is that gonna change? They're, they're Don't no, be afraid of no, me. No, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm just, I'm say so, so there are no changes proposed off-site. So everything's staying the same except for on, on the property that's shown. All right, now Clifton Avenue. I live at the right in the cul-de-sac. I have two houses there. Clifton Avenue used to go all the way through. They put a fence up, I'm in the cul-de-sac. Doesn't go through now, but is that gonna go through once this circus happens? No. It's not going to, it, because the, the it'll destroy, staying. it will destroy Dewey Heights. So the, the, the gate that's there now is remaining. Okay. Uh, when are they going to start maintaining that, that berm? Uh, if, like I said, if this is an indication of what this circus is going to do with their doings, the, the berm is not a good example of what's going to happen later on because it is a total stinking mess. And they have trees that they're gonna cut down, a million zillion trees that, uh, it, to me, it's not necessary to kill these trees. Plus, I don't want, there's deer out there. I don't want my deer, deer messed with. I love animals. So I don't want my deer, deer to be messed with. So if I find anybody messing with them, there's, trust me, <laughs> I'm cuckoo. <laughs> and I admit it. I, I admit that I'm crazy. So, <laughs> what could I say? The firm you're referring to, what property? Where Sorry, sir, I, I can't hear you, sir. This berm that you're talking about, on whose property does it exist? On whose property? It's Sears' property. Okay. 
Yeah, that berm is, it runs all along, as uh, the as gentleman you know, said, I think Mr. Yeah, Kelso yeah. said, Mr. Kelso said it runs all along Clifton Avenue from Route 18 all the way up to the cul-de-sac by my house, which is on the corner of Cotter Drive and Clifton Avenue. And what I've heard is that there'll be improvements to this associated with this. Yeah, drive. but they're not indicating that now. They, they, they cut the lawn today. A, a poor kid was out there with a push with, with a push mower, push, and, and that'll take him a month of Sundays, a month of Sundays to, to cut that grass there. The, the applicant doesn't currently own the property. It's some company from Long Island that they get. They're probably paying them 10 cents an hour because that's the, work, that's the amount of work they're doing. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Uh, all I can say to that point is that the, the applicant that's before you this evening is not the current property owner. Um, the, if the applicant were to be approved, then the applicant would, would close on the property and take ownership. And at that point, not only would maintenance of the property be our responsibility, but we would be able to implement the proposal that's before you to enhance the buffer as we've, as we've described with all of the additional plantings and also taking out the, the dead and dying trees and putting in hardier ones that are native species. But there are stuff. some trees that they have marked to cut down that aren't dead. They're not dead, they're, they're healthy trees. So I don't know where they're getting this from. They're gonna cut down like 100 trees there, some ridiculous Mr. amount. Mr. Tronco, can, can you speak to the trees that are, are being flagged for removal and why? Uh, most of the trees are declining or you know, partially dead. Um, there's I think about 60 limbs that are being removed. Most of the trees are multi-stem stem type trees. So I'm declining and partially dead, but so, are you so going to cut me down? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I think the representation was that they're I'm trying to make a record here. The representation was they're they're past their useful life, and and they are because they're they're trees that are are about to die or are falling over. So we have tagged uh, selectively through the buffer to take out the ones that are dead or in decline and uh, leave a majority of the trees in place. Um, okay, and there's only gonna be one entrance in and out of Dewey Heights, is that correct? Yes. The, the access to Dewey Heights is not changing. That nothing off site is changing. Okay, and the berm is gonna protect us from the circus, right? Uh, <laughs> there, there, the, the berm, the 100 foot berm that's there today is being enhanced and that should provide screening. See, I couldn't hear anything because you people don't know how to project your voices, man. You gotta project, you know, projection. And I couldn't hear, I couldn't hear a word that anybody was saying. Because <laughs> it's like, yeah. It sounds, it sounds to me like some of these improvements that are planned for this but for this uh, berm that you're talking about might actually help from your standpoint I I hope so because it is really in b b b b bad shape <laughs> <laughs> bad bad shape and you. you're gonna get a bill from the Screen Actors Guild <laughs> and, and a, after I belong to American Federation of, T of Radio and Television Artists too, and Actors Equity. So I'm on camera now, and, and that's it. It's very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't come cheap. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Adios, amigos. <laughs> Peace, love, happiness. Yes, indeed. And, and just remember. <laughs> I'm the longest continuing resident of Dewey Heights. I'm called, I'm like considered the village idiot or carnival trash in Dewey Heights. And I'm proud of it. <laughs> I'm, and I do it well. I'm an idiot and I do it well. So it's always good to do something good. You know, if you do it well, you're successful. Thank you. Peace. Thank you. <laughs> Our, uh, <laughs> our uh, final uh, speaker is uh, Patricia Bombala. I'm going to take my mask off because I'm kind of suffocating, but it is one of the privileges of living in Dewey Heights to have Mr. Sika as my neighbor for the last 25 years. 
I promise you, you've never been to parties like we have on Cotter Drive. My name is Patricia Bomblin. I'm a resident of Dewey Heights. I live at 18 Cotter Drive, which is down at the end of the uh, other part of the berm. Good evening, Mr. Solomon. It is, I do swear, sir, to tell the truth, I always do. And it is a pleasure to see you. I haven't seen you in a number of years. Yes. Yes, B as in boy, O, M as in Mary, B as in boy, E, L, Y, N as in Nancy. I do swear to tell Yes, sir, I do. Thank you. Uh, I think all the comments about the berm are relevant. They were comments I wanted to emphasize. I, I'm not going to repeat them. I echo them. My chief concern is I have seen some of the trees marked. I see the trees every day, several times a day. I am concerned that um, we're going to lose the thickness and the height. Like, we've got, we've got a lot of screening, and we want to maintain and build up the density. What has happened is, it's true, Sears was a great neighbor. Sears went into decline. You've read about it in the press. And as it went into decline, it took care of the berm less. And after Hurricane Sandy, it really went down. Um, the upper part, Clif the Clifton Avenue part, has been better maintained than the Cotter Drive part. They pay us no mind on the Cotter Drive part. They pay more mind to Clifton Avenue. We want equal time to Clifton Avenue. Um, I will say to you, our neighbors on Cotter Drive are concerned about affordable housing. They don't like the fact that this beautiful development that we all know has to happen. We know it has to happen. We want it to happen. What was, what was going on in that parking lot, you don't want to know. It was disgusting. All right? The place went down. They, Sears went to pop, right? So, but, but the, my neighbors overwhelmingly agree that housing developments in the city of New Brunswick should be integrated socioeconomically. That it's healthy for our society, it's healthy for our community, it's healthy for our children and their future more than anything else. And I say to you something that I preach. New Jersey is one of only three states in the whole United States that has an anti-segregation clause in its state constitution. And any public official who has dared to try to enforce it has been summarily dismissed. And that goes back to the 1960s. And so when we come to you and we say there's no affordable housing component, we are advocates for a better future for our families and our children. And to have unsegregated schools and unsegregated communities. So I know it's not your jurisdiction and your domain, but this is an audience that needs to hear this message. Because I don't know what board you're going to be on next. The mayor will put you somewhere else. But think about it and do your homework. Now, I do have questions. I didn't hear how many people are expected to live in this development once it is complete. Um, I don't know that I have that figure. Um, looking for Mr. Sepper, did you have an assumption about that? I don't have individual people. I can okay. tell you the total bless you the total number of units. Is that or is that helpful? The number of units. I don't know where I did my class. Yeah. yeah. So it's one of the buildings is 268 residential units. The other mixed use building is 262, and there's 190 townhomes. So the total, I believe, is 720 when you add that up. That's the number of units. Obviously, there's some studios, one bedroom, so two some bedrooms. Some figure two to four times of that in that range. I bring up Mr. Eldridge, one of my other honorable neighbors who lives across the street from Mr. Sika. Uh, he has been suffering, and the people along that corner have been suffering with this sewer that overflows particularly with a particular awful stench, especially in the summers. And it is just unacceptable that this project is being put forth without upgrade to the sewer. There must be upgrade to the sewer. You are going, I mean, you had Sears there. It was a big place. But you didn't have 
you know, that many human beings living on that space 24-7 using the sewer. All right? And I'm telling you, it's going to be worse. Um, additional, no renewable energy in this project. Highly objectionable. Additional, all those people coming using electricity, no renewable energy, no upgrade to the grid. The grid is used by our neighborhood, the, the apartments behind us, part of Rutgers, although they may have some of their own stuff, Rutgers, that's another problem. Um, I had other, I also want to urge you on the request for a waiver on the trees. Give them the waiver for the spacing of the trees, but please don't give them the waiver for the number of the trees that the ordinance requires. This whole neighborhood, Dewey Heights, has lost so many trees in the last decade, especially with the widening of Route 18 and the wildlife that we had in that neighborhood, which included everything from turkeys and chipmunks and rabbits and everything else, the birds, everything was, was decimated. The pandemic brought some of it back miraculously. But please hold them to the number of trees, but let them put them where they can to make their project beautiful and efficient. I agree with that. We need trees. We also need trees for the pollution. They're near Route 18. I have a lot more that I'd like to share with you, but um, I, think, I, I think the 30-year abatement is abysmal. I'd like to know who's going to do their uh, sanitation. Are they paying for it themselves? Is the city paying for it? Um, and I'd really like them to keep maintenance of the berm. I would like them to do the berm, because you know what? What the guy said earlier about this not being a box, about this having some, some aesthetic attractiveness, we got too many boxes that have been put up in New Brunswick. I love the fact that this is not another box. So if you can answer those questions. I, I'll, I'll try to cover them. So um, I'm going to work backwards, I think. So yes, the applicant um, does intend to maintain the berm. And I, I, if I didn't say it, I meant to say it at the outset, which is that the applicant um, would be willing to agree to a condition of approval requiring it to enter into a berm maintenance agreement with the city. Um, we're happy to do that, and we intend to take on that responsibility. Um, with regard to your question about sanitation, did you mean like trash pickup? Or yes. Just, who's, okay. Who's doing it? A private hauler paid okay. for by the applicant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's a good thing. The one other thing is about the gate that Mr. Sika referenced. You need to know something. When Route 18 was recently being resurfaced late at night, right, which isn't a city thing, I think it's a state resurfacing. If, if you tried to get into or leave Cotter, the Dewey Heights, you couldn't enter Dewey Heights. If you are an ambulance person from somewhere that doesn't know about Dewey Heights, you would have gone in circles and circles and you would have never got inside. If you're a new fireman and you don't know how to get into Dewey Heights, you would have never got inside late at night when they were doing the resurfacing. One of our concerns in the neighborhood is that the gate be there. The gate is there. God forbid there's some kind of crazy emergency. Um, we know there's flooding on Route 18. Yeah, we're, we're, the, the I know. gate is not changing. I, I, I just want to emphasize the importance of the gate, the importance of uh, our EMTs, our, our firemen, our police having, being able to get a key for that gate because it, it can become a critical uh, situation. And, you know, it w w not, not expected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that the last of the comments? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, do board members have any um, uh, suggestions or conditions uh, um, in response to the uh, uh, some of the comments we received? I mean, I think we've heard some things which uh, from the from the applicant that indicate that it might be an improvement. Uh, addressing their concerns. I'd like to address the general's concerns about his, his uh, sewage issues. However, it, it's, it's off-site. It sounds to me like that's a, you know, something that the city really ought to be addressing uh, that's not necessarily related to this development. I don't, 
to feel as a condition. I, I personally, I'm trying to look for a way to address that, but I don't see how, how to make that a condition associated with this, this development. But, but do we have... Uh, board members, has anyone else want to, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, do we have, um, can you speak specifically to, and it's a fair enough point that there was previously a retail location there that didn't have what's called a safe estimate of 2,500 people, right? And what that ultimately would do to the sewage line. I think it's also fair to state that what's going on with your section of it is a city thing, which should absolutely be addressed, but the stress that this would put on that that could ultimately be uh, result in uh, intensifying an issue that has not yet been resolved. So I'm, I'm going to ask Mr. Savage to talk generally about the the process that the applicant is in the middle of to make sure that the sewage system is right sized for the proposed development. I think that's probably the best way to address it. Um, outside my expertise. Oh, Mr. Dominguez is raising his hand. Good evening. My name is Dan Burke. I'm the board engineer and I'm also the city engineer. And under my authority and the, the office I, I stand with is, is a municipal engineer. We address uh, and, and deal with the uh, uses of the, of the sanitary sewer system. I heard enough tonight and I heard something just previous to this and I'll work with uh, the applicant's engineer and we'll get into this matter very quickly. Um, I will probably, I'm going to see if I can get our sewer crews out there and consider jetting that line because um, I heard something from the developer's contractor about the disconnects and so forth. Also as a condition of this approval, uh, one of my conditions is that we have to model uh, the connection points. There's two sewer connection points proposed, one at Phelps and one at the, in Dewey Heights and Clifton Avenue. And we will model the anticipated flows going in each direction to ensure that the, uh, the, the existing system, the city's existing system, can accept and transport those flows adequately. We have uh, uh, developed a uh, computerized model uh, we have all the segmented, all the, all the slopes, all the diameters, all the material types throughout the city. And as a condition of this approval, the applicant has agreed to fund the modeling of the sewer flows anticipated <coughs> from this development through our system to ensure we can accept it adequately. And it's also, uh, there will also be a, uh, what they call a TWA permit requirement because of uh, exceedance of a certain gallons per day flow. Isn't that correct, Mr. Savage? That's correct. All right. But that uh, TWA is through the, the DEP, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. That so that's got to be signed off by the city. It's got to be signed off by the receiving agency, which is MCUA, and it's got to be signed off by DEP correct. before this can go can go forward. Correct. And just, sorry, the TWA is a treatment works approval, which is, again, determined. it's meant to ensure that the um, sewer servicing the property is appropriate. And just, just to bring this up, the, Mr. Burke, that's in your memo to the applicant, yes. correct? So we don't have to have that broken out as a separate no, I it is. condition. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I believe there was a condition of that the applicant enter into a maintenance agreement for the buffer zone firm that's been discussed. Yes, I heard yeah. that. Is that, on, is that one of the conditions that's currently on? Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Any other recommendations or conditions from board members associated with this development? And I just want to uh, confirm with Dan that this site plan, which is what we're here to consider, um, is consistent with the city zoning and also is consistent with the board's approved redevelopment uh, for this area, correct? It's, it, it's consistent with the redevelopment plan, which in this case is an overlay which supplants the underlying zoning. The underlying zoning for this site uh, was for the Sears use. So in this case, the, uh, the redevelopment plan is an overlay on the site, which yeah, just, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Katie, do you want to address any? Other conditions associated with it? Uh, yeah, um, so should the board act favorably on this application? Excuse me, could you go slower? Oh, sure. Thank should you. I can also email this to you tomorrow. Okay, but I'd like to sure. have a nice clean. <laughs> sure. Uh, should the board act favorably on the application, we recommend the following conditions of approval. Compliance with the terms of the city engineer report dated July 11, 2022. 
payment of a site performance bond in an amount reviewed and approved by the city engineer, submission of a site inspection escrow deposit for engineering inspection fees in an amount calculated pursuant to Title 16-24-160, Payment of all water and sewer connection fees pursuant to Titles 1304 and 1308. Issuance of a road opening permit from the city engineer required. The applicant shall schedule a pre-construction meeting with the city engineering department. Compliance with the terms of the Vignell Consulting Group report dated July 8, 2022. Payment of a redeveloper fee if applicable to the city of New Brunswick. Planning review escrow funded for all anticipated post-approval reviews. Payment of any other fees due to the City of New Brunswick related to the development or use of the project. Payment of all outstanding taxes and water sewer fees. Middlesex County Planning Board approval or waiver. Freehold Soil Conservation District approval or waiver. Any other outside agency approval or waiver as required. Um, filing of a subdivision in accordance with the MAP Filing Act. Submission of engineering and or architectural plans to comply with any changes required by the planning or engineering memos or plan amendments offered at the hearing of any. Execution of a Title 39 parking enforcement agreement. Um, compliance with the city's water service system ordinance. Trash recycling pickup to be provided by a private hauler at no expense to the city. Um, the applicant will enter into a maintenance agreement with the city to maintain the buffer. Um, the applicant shall individually meter um, the townhouse units um, per the city um, water utility. Um, all utilities and other site improvements be maintained by the applicant at their sole expense. All on-site utilities to be constructed underground. All temporary encroachments in the public right-of-way shall require city council approval. All construction staging shall be done on-site unless an encroachment allowing into the public right-of-way is approved by city council. Streets shall be kept clean of sediment and debris. The applicant shall cause the streets to be cleaned if directed to do so by the Director of Public Works. Tracking pads shall be installed at all construction exits. Replacement of damaged streets, curbs, and sidewalks per the direction of the city engineer. And the applicant is seeking preliminary and final site plan approval. Um, and I have marked design waivers for um, parking lot setback to the right of way, parking lot screening and landscaping, um, parking area buffer width, street tree spacing, and foundation plantings. And that's all I have. I'm sorry, did you also say the subdivision? I meant to miss it. I know you said preliminary and final oh, site yes. plan. And, yes, and subdivision. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. Just wanted to make sure. Thanks. Did you, I guess there's also condition of, I guess, the map filing. Oh, okay. yeah. I, I did uh, filing of subdivision oh, in yeah. with the map filing act. <clears throat> Motion to approve based on the aforementioned conditions. Oh, I have more questions. At least one more question. Uh, can we, we discuss these questions or do we need to act on that motion? Um, uh, procedurally, Mr. Solomon. Withdraw I'll purpose. withdraw for now. Oh, thank you. Um, you spoke specifically to the sewer and that it won't place added stress on the grid, and that's awesome. Uh, to that respect, can you speak specifically to the electrical concerns also raised? I cannot, um, but let me see if our engineer can. We, yeah. Um, I mean, at this stage, we haven't started uh, in-depth conversation with the utility company, so that's part of their approval. If their um, if upgrades to their system are required for this development, then that'll have to be addressed as part of that approval. Um, we're going to have to have their approval for any connections we make. So, in other words, if, if the electric uh, company requires that upgrades be made in order to serve the then project, the applicant will make them. You, you would have to make the, the improvements that would be required for the connections. Anything else before we proceed with the motion? I reinstate my motion to approve based on the aforementioned conditions. Second. I'll second. Hi. Uh, Pacheco? Yes. Matthew Ferguson? Yes. Is Troy Ludwig? Yes. Adam Dorno? Yes. Zach Wright? Staying. Anthony Camioni? Yes. Kevin Hoagland? Yes. Bob Cardigo? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate all of your time and attention. Thank you. Uh, this meeting is 
not over yet. Moving on to any other matters of interest to the public. Yes. Good evening, members of the board. Charles Craddaville. Anyone else? Can we get the noise down a little bit? I'm sorry, before the board decides, would you like us to leave these edits, correct? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Does anyone else other than Mr. Cradiville want to provide a statement, any other matters of interest to the public? Good evening. Members of the board, I don't mean to prolong the meeting. I did want to follow up at prior meetings. I had asked about uh, hybrid meetings where folks could contribute to the meetings through a conferencing platform. I know the chair had promised to look into it. This was a couple months ago, and I know it was the chair and you're the vice chair, but did anybody look into it? Is that something that this board would be open to, to doing to improve public input and make meetings more accessible? I have no information on that at this time. I, I can't report any progress in that regard. Can you? I, I have nothing to add from you. Okay. Sorry. Can I expect an answer at a future meeting if I come back and ask a fourth time? Uh, I, I don't have an answer for that right now. <laughs> well, I uh, have a feeling I'll be back, so I'll... Uh, <laughs> Hope somebody will have an answer, but but wish you all a good evening and, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.